Okay, well, it's about 10 o'clock on this rainy Saturday morning, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming out on such a rainy day for our symposium dedicated to the exhibition, The Horse in Ancient Greek Art. Um, my name is Peter Schertz. I am the Jack and Marianne Frabel Curator of Ancient Art, and I'd like to welcome all of you here to the VMFA today. Today's program is going to be really very exciting, intellectually and just emotionally, certainly for me. Um, most of the contributors for the symposium also contributed to our catalog, but we also have an extra talk about horses on ancient coins, which I'm really looking forward to. And I just thought that I would explain a little bit about the exhibition. It is a collaborative project between the National Sporting Library and Museum in Middleburg, Virginia, and VMFA. While not all of it's Virginia-based, many of the vases are in Virginia collections, and many of our speakers today are from Virginia, which was sort of a happy coincidence for a state art museum to work out. And with the exhibition, hopefully many of you, or all of you, have already seen it. But we set out a number of goals for the exhibition. And the first of them, of course, was to display beautiful works of Greek art, primarily vases, something that hasn't been done as an exhibition at this museum since 1993, when we hosted the Goddess and Polis exhibition. So as the curator of ancient art here, I get to tell people this is a once in a generation experience that we hope to make more frequent in the future. In addition to highlighting the beauty of Greek art, we also wanted to explore it in its context. So when you go through the exhibition, we, you'll notice that there's a lot of didactic material explaining how the vases are used in ancient society, how they were functioned, and how the ornamentation itself functions, since the Greeks didn't have a notion of art for art's sake. We also, of course, wanted to explore the horse. And the horse, not just as it manifests in Greek society, but in modern society. And that's where the nature of this collaboration worked out really well. Because when I was about 12 years old, I got scraped off the back of a horse, and I haven't been on a horse since then. <laughs> Although I love them, and I actually would be happy to ride a horse again. I think I got over that trauma. But that's just my way of saying, I really don't know a lot about horses till I began this project. And at the National Sporting Library and Museum, of course, they know a great deal about horses and horse tack, but has nothing to do with thumb tacks, but is the equipment that you use in order to ride horses and not get scraped off their back. Uh, so, but I do know about ancient art and displaying it. So the two strengths of the institutions were able to complement each other. And of course, we had many outside people helping us with this, um, both practically in terms of very generous private collectors, very generous museums who lent to the exhibition, and a number of people who helped sponsor the exhibition. And I'd especially like to thank some of them who are here today, most notably Jack and Marianne Frabel, who have been longtime supporters of the museum and of the ancient art department here. And I saw Mike Beale also in the audience, who also sponsored the exhibition here. And a number of other people who I'm not sure want me to be thank want to be thanked in person, but I thank all of you. But most of all, I thank you as the audience for coming here. I think it's going to be a really exciting day. Um, oh, and before I turn the introduce Nicole, my co-curator, I was asked to bring to your attention a change in schedule. As you know, it is a rainy day, and the weather has been quite unpredictable this month. And because we weren't sure whether there would be snowfall, or hail, or sleet, we decided that for the afternoon session, we'll have a lunch as on the schedule from 12 until 1, 
And rather than a gallery visit, we will go directly into the afternoon session. So that session will begin here at 1 p.m. And afterwards, for those who would like to go and explore the galleries, I'll be there and I'm happy to answer questions in the gallery or to walk people through the installation. And that will give you time to enjoy it. So I now would like to introduce my co-curator on this project, Nicole Stribling, who will be doing the introductions um, she is the curator of, of art at the National Sporting Library and Museum. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this rainy morning. Uh, as Peter said, my name is Nicole Stribling. I'm the curator of permanent collections at the National Sporting Library and Museum in Middleburg, Virginia. And I'm also thrilled to have been the co-curator for this exhibition. Um, I just want to say it's been a real pleasure working with the team here at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts on this project, as well as the wonderful scholars we have joining us for today's program. The exhibition uh, first was on view in Middleburg this past fall, uh, which Middleburg is known as horse country to many. And then it came here to Richmond in February. And I'm happy to report that so far over 52,000 people have been through this show. So we're thrilled with the positive response that it's received. Uh, I know that after hearing today's great presentations, you all will want to spend some more time in that show and add to that number. We have a really impressive lineup of speakers for you today. And it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sean Hemingway from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Dr. Hemingway is the John A. and Carol O. Moran Acting Curator in Charge for the Department of Greek and Roman Art at the Met. He specializes in Greek and Roman bronzes. Uh, he's busy as a curator and also as an archaeologist and has excavated prehistoric, classical, and Roman sites in Greece and Spain. He received his doctorate from Bryn Mawr, studied at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens as a Fulbright Scholar, and has been a visiting curator at the American Academy in Rome. He's the author of numerous scholarly publications as well as his essay in our exhibition catalog. You can see four really beautiful vases that are here on loan from the Met in the exhibition. I hope you spend some time with them while you're there. Today, Dr. Hemingway is going to tell us about some of the earliest images of the horse in ancient Greek art in his presentation on noble steeds the origins of the horse in Greek art. Thank you, Nicole and uh, uh, Peter and all your colleagues here at the, at the VMFA for bringing me here this, this morning to speak to you. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. The Mycenaeans who lived during the Late Bronze Age in storied citadels and wrote in an early form of Greek were the first culture in mainland Greece to feature horses prominently in their art. Although domesticated horses are thought to have been introduced into Greece earlier during the Middle Helladic period, possibly from Anatolia, some of the earliest representations of horses appear in the 16th century on the relief decorated limestone stelae that marked the tombs of wealthy elite warriors at Mycenae. A particularly good example is the stele you see at left that stood, that stood above shaft grave five in grave circle A, where Heinrich Schliemann excavated in the late 19th century the famous gold mask of Agamemnon. The stele carved in shallow relief illustrates a charging chariot drawn by a formidable horse shown in mid-gallop. The reins taut in the charioteer's right hand as he leans forward, a long sword in his left hand. A man holding a sword stands to the right of the charging chariot and spirals fill the field. An upper register of interconnected spirals may evoke water, most likely the sea, an ever-present feature of the Greek landscape. The figure driving the chariot has been identified as the man buried in the tomb, a warrior killed in battle, fighting the man to the right. 
The variety of luxury objects from Grave Circle A, including a wide range of feasting vessels, makes clear that the Mycenaeans were in contact with many other cultures around the Eastern Mediterranean, from Egypt and especially Minoan Crete, to Syria and Anatolia, and the Pontus region to the north. The practice of riding chariots likely came, likely came from the ancient Near East, where chariots were used since the early second millennium BC. And the Mycenaean practice can be seen in the context of a wider international milieu in the late Bronze Age. Several of the Shaftgrave stele depict chariots on horses as their focal scene. An engraved gold signet ring from Shaftgrave IV, which you see here, depicts a stag hunt by horse-drawn chariot and is the finest of several Mycenaean scenes of hunting on horseback. Thus, even at this very early period, two of the primary uses for horses in ancient Greece, in warfare and to hunt large game, are evident in Mycenaean art, where horses appear as symbols of a powerful and wealthy elite. Given the prominence of Minoan civilization on the island of Crete during the first half of the second millennium BC, it is not surprising that horses appear in Minoan art, but little evidence has come to light before the Mycenaean occupation of Knossos in the late Minoan II period, around the middle of the 15th century BC. A fresco fragment of a horse-drawn chariot from Knossos, shown at left in a reconstruction drawing by Mark Cameron, was once dated to the late Minoan I period, but is now generally dated to after the Mycenaean occupation. The jasper amygdaloid gem from Knossos, shown at the right in the British Museum, from Knossos, with a chariot, driver, and single horse, is also now thought to belong to the 14th century BC. The Linear B archive at the Palace of Pylos in the Western Peloponnese records a number of Mycenaean deities, including Potnea Hippia, the mistress of horses, an epithet later sometimes given to the Greek goddesses Demeter and Athena. Unfortunately, little besides the name is recorded. No myths, hymns, or cult center are known. Linear B tablets from Mycenaean Knossos, you see one at left, and Pylos, record extensive references to large numbers of chariots and their component parts, and the location of the area where chariots were manufactured at the Palace at Pylos has been identified. In three-dimensional art, Mycenaean artists produced painted terracotta figurines of horses, men on horses, and small-scale models of chariots. Although only preserved in fragments, Horses also appear in Mycenaean monumental fresco paintings. Horses, especially pulling chariots, were popular in Mycenaean pictorial vase painting. A series of craters decorated with horse-drawn chariot scenes manufactured in the 14th and 13th centuries BC in the Argolid have been found in tombs and other contexts in Cyprus and along the, the coast of modern Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. A fine example from the second quarter of the 14th century BC, illustrated at right and discovered on Cyprus, probably in a tomb at Moroni, is in the Metz Chesnola collection. Two chariots, each drawn by two horses, moving in stately procession, decorate both sides of the main body of the vase. Within each chariot is a charioteer and a rider wearing long spotted robes. The spots on the chariot box may indicate that it was made from animal hide. The pairs of horses are rendered carefully, the bodies as one, but with two tails and two sets of delicate hind and four legs. In metalwork, a finely wrought bronze vessel stand from Enkomi on Cyprus of the 12th century BC features complex iconography including a processing two-horse chariot with a charioteer and passenger, which you see at left. Equine sculptural vases are known from Crete and Cyprus towards the end of the Late Bronze Age. Sculptural rita, libation vessels, 
had a long tradition in the Aegean before the equid examples and were presumably used for ritual libations and special drinking ceremonies. A Cypriot terracotta write on a proto-white painted ware in the form of a horse in the Metz collection and shown at right follows in the tradition of Aegean type pottery but is locally made in a period when trade connections were more limited. The idea of the horse as a vessel could conceivably have inspired the story of the Trojan horse that led to the end of the Trojan War, which scholars generally place in this period, although the first reference to the Trojan horse is centuries later. The collapse of the Mycenaean palatial economy toward the end of the Bronze Age led to a period of impoverishment and uncertainty throughout the Aegean that is sometimes known as the Iron Age. In Cyprus, however, some settlements continued to thrive and Mycenaean traditions would have endured, their oral history passed down from generation to generation. As a community of traders with a valuable commodity, copper, the very word in Greek, Kypros, gives its name to the island, the Cypriots maintained trade contacts during the Iron Age, both with the Phoenicians, whose trade outposts were established at this time throughout the Mediterranean, and with the Greeks. Some of the earliest Iron Age pottery imported from Greece to Cyprus comes from Lefkandi in northern Evia, a large island just north of Attica. Lefkandi was a major center in this period with strong ties to Athens and many connections around the Mediterranean evident in the wide distribution of its geometric painted pottery and the grave offerings of its wealthy tombs. The Iron Age cemeteries at Lefkandi have yielded especially interesting evidence for the art and mythology of horses, as well as actual remains of horses. Most remarkable is the large painted terracotta statuette of a centaur, shown here from around 900 BC, one of the earliest representations that we have from Greece of a centaur, the mythical creature that is part horse and part man. The left Candy centaur with his six-fingered hand and wound on his knee has been identified as Chiron, the wise centaur who tutored Greek heroes, especially Achilles. Although the ritual sacrifice of horses is attested in Homer, relatively few horse burials have been found from late Bronze Age and Iron Age Greece. Again, left Candy is of great consequence. Its 10th century BC Heroon from the Tumba Cemetery is one of the most important funerary assemblages from Iron Age Greece ever discovered. A large building illustrated at left was made into a tomb for a warrior whose crema cremated remains were deposited in an heirloom bronze crater of Cipro Mycenaean manufacture illustrated at lower left and buried together with the inhumation of a young woman bedecked with gold jewelry and breast ornaments, illustrated at lower center, a woman who was probably sacrificed at the time of the burial. Their four horses were sacrificed as seen at lower right, placed in an adjoining compartment, and the entire structure was covered with a monumental mound, as you see in the section at right. The Homeric practice of sacrificing horses at the time of an elite warrior's burial recurs on Cyprus, most notably in the royal tombs at Salamis in the 8th and 7th centuries BC. During the Iron Age and especially the geometric period, the formation of the major Greek city-states such as Athens, Corinth, and Sparta occurred. This period witnessed the widespread expansion of Greek culture through the establishment of Greek colonies on the coast of Anatolia, North Africa, and in Sicily and southern Italy. Although there are definite cultural links to the Bronze Age, the geometric period is in many ways the true formative period for Greek art. The nature of geometric Greek art with its reductive and abstract forms at a time when the Greek alphabet was just coming into use makes interpretation of its art difficult and often uncertain. It is remarkable that among the relatively limited repertoire of figural imagery, the horse is prominent and clearly important. Among the most distinctive works of art produced in the geometric period are the bronze statuettes of horses that have been found in many parts of the Greek world, 
especially at sanctuaries where they were offered to the gods as votive dedications. A particularly large number have been excavated at the sanctuary of Olympia. Workshops throughout mainland Greece and on Crete produced these distinctive sculptures, which were sometimes embellished with stamped and incised decoration. Inlays were also sometimes used for the eyes to enliven the horses, like the impressive example shown at left from Berlin, although the inlay itself is rarely preserved. Individual male horses were popular. Groups such as pairs of horses or the image of a mare with her foal are also known but are much less common. Among the more than 1,100 specimens known, the quality and stylistic features of geometric bronze horse statuettes vary wi widely. A fine example in the Metz collection, shown at right and attributed to a Corinthian workshop, exhibits the clarity of form that makes the best of these small artworks among the finest bronze sculptures of the period. Similar to other examples of geometric horses, this figure stands at attention with its ears pricked forward and has been reduced to its essence. The sculptor has emphasized its powerful hind legs and taut, elegant body that stand on fine, thin legs the indication of the front knees inverted to balance symmetrically those of the hind legs. Its thick, strong neck with the arcing line of its mane seamlessly transitions to the carefully delineated head. The emphasis on the perfection of the horse's body and its physical form is a notable forerunner of the predilection for the representation of the heroic, nude male body that would become a prominent feature of Greek archaic sculpture. Horses are represented on the tops of the ring handles of large bronze tripod cauldrons, which were among the most important and expensive prizes awarded at competitions in geometric Greece, and are known from Olympia, Delphi, Argos, and the sanctuary to Zeus in the Aden cave on Crete. The horse attachments appear first in the 9th century BC in relatively small numbers, when other kinds of subjects such as birds and bullheads also occur, as you see in the examples from Delphi shown on the right. To judge from the archaeological record, horses became the most prominent figural attachment of the tripod cauldron during the first half of the 8th century BC and continued into the third quarter of the 8th century when images of a horse and warrior are also placed on tripod cauldrons. Though chariot races later became the most prestigious events at the Panhellenic Games held at Olympia, Delphi, Nemea, and Isthmia, as well as at local festivals such as the Panathenaic Games in Athens, there is little evidence for them in the geometric period. The horses, therefore, that surmounted the ring handles of the impressive geometric bronze cauldrons of the 8th century BC may have had other meanings, such as a more generic symbol of the aristocracy, an excellence embodied in equine form. Although better known as the god of the sea, Poseidon was the patron deity of horses and horse racing. It is interesting that fish and horses are sometimes combined in geometric art, as on the incised decoration of bronze clothing pins or fibulae. A fine and well-preserved example from the Rabin collection, shown in two views here, depicts a horse on the main panel of the catch plate together with water birds, while a series of fish appear prominently on the reverse side, shown on the right. The, juxtap the juxtaposition is perhaps a reference to Poseidon's dual nature. The original owner of the fibula may have identified with the god. Another intriguing theory proposes a quite different interpretation of the same iconography on the late geometric fibulae. The horse and fish are seen as symbolic of the earth and water, the temporal elements, indicating a worldview similar to that expressed by the contemporary Boeotian poet Hesiod. The water birds around the horse represent the air and sky and are creatures that commune between land and water. Thus, the fibula may represent separate elements of the visible universe in harmony with each other, which would have been pleasing to its owner, whether it was worn in life, 
buried in death, or dedicated to the gods. Excavations on the north slope of the Areopagus Hill of Athens in 1967 revealed a protogeometric tomb of a woman that provided significant insight into aristocratic Athenian society in the middle of the 9th century BC. The burial contained a large terracotta model granary and an elaborate terracotta pyxis, or box, whose lid features five model granaries, which you see at the left. The granaries on the pyxis lid identified the deceased with the highest property class of archaic Athens, the Pentacosia medimnoi, whose members produced some 500 measures of grain each year from their land. The lids of Pyxides, frequently buried in the tombs of elite women, became a prominent place for symbolic display in the geometric period. And from the middle geometric two period, in the first half of the eighth century BC, horses became the prevalent aristocratic symbol to appear on them, sometimes singly, like you see here at right on an example from Princeton in the exhibition upstairs, or in pairs or in groups of up to four horses. Owning a horse was a status symbol, and in archaic Greece, the, the aristocratic term hippies, or horse-owning class, meant that a man could participate in the cavalry. Horses first appear in geometric painted pottery around 950 BC during the protogeometric period and become one of the most popular figural ornaments on a variety of vase shapes, including amphorae, like the one shown here on display, shown here on the left, uh, on display in the exhibition, as well as on cups, jugs, and craters. Horses appear singly and in pairs or large groups. Sometimes they are represented with people, such as in horse taming scenes, pulling chariots and carts, or more rarely with mounted warriors. A remarkably well-preserved and impressive example, and one of the largest vases to be exported in ancient times, is the Chesnola crater in the Metz collection shown at right. The vase was probably made on Evia early in the second half of the 8th century BC, and shipped to Cyprus soon thereafter, where it was deposited in a monumental tomb as a grave offering. A herd of grazing horses decorates a frieze that encircles the center of the body. Numerous additional horses decorate the ribbon handles and upper body, including horses at a manger that flank the central scene, which depicts goats heraldically placed around a tree of life. The earliest examples of pictorial narrative in Greek art appear in the geometric period, although the specific stories are hard to identify. The majority of Greek geometric images of horses are not part of narrative scenes, but there are a number of notable exceptions in the late geometric period, especially in scenes painted on monumental attic funerary craters. A fine example in the Metz collection, shown here in two views, features the deceased laid out on a bear in a scene of prothesis. Immediately below is, a depic is depicted a procession of six chariots, each pulled by three horses, accompanied by warriors on foot, carrying shields, spears, and swords, in a central frieze that extends all the way around the body of the crater. Amid the procession between two of the warriors is a tripod cauldron that may allude to an athletic or military victory by the dead man if it is not a prize for chariot races held in honor of the deceased, like the funerary games held by Achilles for his friend Patrocles in Book 24 of Homer's Iliad. The iconography with its stately procession and elaborate funerary ritual commemorated the deceased, while the sheer magnitude of the vase amplified the heroic stature of the person whose grave it marked. The seventh century BC, the beginning of the archaic period, witnessed dramatic changes in Greek art, reflecting increased contacts with the Near East and Egypt that led to a more naturalistic style. For the first time, we see an image of the monumental 
wooden horse that the Greeks used to enter Troy and finally end the Trojan War. The scene appears on a large fragmentary Boeotian bronze fibula shown at left in the collection of the British Museum, which dates to the first quarter of the seventh century BC. The type of fibula belonging to the late geometric tradition, but with Im the images incised upon it, both the Trojan horse shown on wheels and with square doors along its belly for the Greeks to, to disembark. And it's a little hard to see, but there are the wheels of the front of the horse there and the little boxes. <laughs> like these guys here. And a scene of the hero Heracles fighting the many-headed Hydra from Lerna herald the vastly expanded repertoire of mythological images that occurs in the Archaic period. And Heracles is here battling. You can see some of the heads of the Hydra here. The Trojan horse myth graces a monumental pithos from the Cycladic island of Mykonos, shown at right, some two generations later, when ceramic workshops in the Greek islands were producing relief-decorated terracotta pithoi with horse imagery. And there's a magnificent example of one uh, up in the galleries upstairs on your way to the horse exhibition. Don't miss it. We had, don't have anything like that at the Met. Mm -hmm. um, this time, the heads of the Greek soldiers within can be seen through the opening along the horse's belly as they begin to exit the horse. In Virgil's Aeneid, the Trojan hero Laocoon states that he fears the Greeks even when they bear gifts, as he tried to convince, to no avail, the Trojans not to bring the monumental horse within the city walls. It is not surprising that the Greeks chose for their trick the image of a horse to leave as an offering to Athena outside the walls of Troy, nor that the Trojans could not resist such an impressive horse. Given the importance of the horse for the Mycenaeans and the singular prominence that the horse held as a votive offering in Greece during the geometric period, it was a choice that would have resonated with all Greeks. There was a plethora of artistic equine innovations in the archaic period, including the introduction of monumental horse sculptures, typically erected as dedications at sanctuaries to the gods. Horses appear in many different art forms, as can be seen in the exhibition upstairs. Images of warriors on horseback from the horse-loving mythical Amazons and distant Scythians of the north to Greeks battling Greeks or Persians enliven the visual repertoire which is replete with more generic images of men riding horses, such as the fine black figure Kylox at right in the VMFA's collection and, and featured in the exhibition upstairs. The gods are represented with their chariots drawn by powerful divine steeds rendered with increasing sophistication as can, as can be seen in a masterful Athenian black figure amphora of the late sixth century BC shown at left that depicts the goddess Athena turning her chariot. Helios, god of the sun, and Nyx, god of night, bring their realms to mortals by crossing the sky in their horse-drawn chariots, scenes that begin to appear in Greek art in the Archaic period. Given the importance of the horse in Greek geometric art, it is not surprising that it figures prominently in Greek Archaic art. What is remarkable is the sheer variety and ingenuity that Greek artists brought to the subject of the horse in this period. And you can see lots of examples upstairs. In conclusion, the origins of the horse in Greek art lie in the very origins of Greek culture during the Mycenaean period of the late Bronze Age. Despite the collapse of Mycenaean civilization at the end of the Bronze Age and a lengthy period of cultural impoverishment during the Iron Age, ties of language, myths preserved for the oral tradition, and a variety of artistic connections affirm the notion that the early Greeks had some knowledge of the remote past when Mycenaean elites identified with horses and represented them in their art. Major monuments from the late Bronze Age, such as the Lion Gate at Mycenae, which you see here on the left, were never completely buried and would have been powerful, visible reminders of the achievements of the Mycenaeans. It is natural that when, in the geometric period, 
During a time of renewed affluence, Greek art emerged with, a, with its strong sense of order and harmony, that the Greeks chose the horse as one of their first and most important pictorial symbols. For the ancient Greeks, the horse remained a highly valued and cherished animal that served as a symbol of power, wealth, and natural beauty, beloved of the gods and humans alike. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. That was great. Those were some really compelling images, some amazing objects. For our next speaker, worlds have collided, happily collided, in working on this project. Not only is she an expert on ancient art of the Mediterranean world, but she is also an equestrian. Dr. Carol Matouche is Mathy Professor Emeritus of Art History at George Mason University. Her specialty is classical bronzes as well, in particular the connections among technology, artistic styles, and the market in the ancient Mediterranean world. Dr. Matouche has been involved with a number of museum exhibitions, including one of my favorites, Pompeii in the Roman Villa, Art and Culture Around the Bay of Naples, which was at the National Gallery of Art. She has published extensively on ancient Greek and Roman art, and her books have won awards from the Archaeological Institute of America and the College Art Association. Today, Carol is going to speak with us about writing in ancient Greece and the writings of the ancient Greek author Xenophon. She's also going to share a little bit about the interesting and sometimes entertaining similarities and differences with writing today. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Peter. Thank you, lenders. Thank you, visitors. This is a great opportunity for me to talk not about ancient bronzes for once, but about horses. Um, and it all began when I was about six, and I took six riding lessons at Patty's Riding School in Burke, Virginia. I got my first horse when I was seven. Back in those days, I memorized the answers to the questions in Jane Dillon's School for Young Riders. And I also studied the Miller's catalogs for what I thought I needed. One summer, my parents took me to England, and I insisted on spending a whole week at the Royal International Horse Show. And you see a couple of pictures of Pat Smythe on her great horses. As a graduate student in Greece, I found I could ride on Mount Parnes. But I'm an archaeologist, of course, and I've written mostly about Greek and Roman sculpture and technology, Pompeii and Herculaneum, the rediscovery of classical antiquity. And horses come into this occasionally, but not much. Here's my chance. Greek histories really begin with the myths and legends about horses. And you see a wonderful horse on the left, uh, Pegasus, the winged horse from the blood of the Gorgon Medusa, born when Perseus cut off her head. Bellerophon tamed Pegasus with a golden bridle and got that horse to do everything he wanted except to take him up to Mount Olympus at that point Bellerophon was thrown by Pegasus, and he never got to the home of the gods. The first centaur was a son of a Thessalian and a cloud. Thessaly was remote, so there were plenty of stories about um, people in the distant past up there who had caught and tamed wild horses. Thrace was even more remote than Thessaly, and according to one story, Diomedes, the king there, had a team of four fire-breathing mares. He fed them human flesh. The eighth labor of Heracles was to catch those horses, which he did with four horses with one halter, 
and he dragged them out of the stable. Diomedes came running, Heracles clubbed him down, and the king's horses ate him. After that, they didn't cause any more trouble, but went along happily with Heracles. The Scythians also lived outside the territories that were familiar to the Greeks. They were nomads of the steppes. By the seventh century BC, they had saddles, and there's one at the lower right. No stirrups, however. Their bits were simple jointed snaffles, as at the lower left. The Greeks believed that Scythian women, unlike the sheltered Greek women that they knew, were warriors, riders, archers, who lived and fought fearlessly, aggressively, and skillfully with men. Lysias wrote that they were the first of all to ride horses. What were the rules for carving something like the Parthenon frieze, you wonder, as opposed to the way things appear in real life? How much did these carved interpretations conflict with what riders and horses actually looked like? As we know from the art in this exhibition, the riding horses of ancient Greece carry handsome youths in procession, gods into battle, boys in races, and men to the hunt. The best horses were bred in Macedonia, Boeotia, and Thessaly. Good horses also came from the Western Greek colonies of Campania, Apulia, and Sicily. City-states boasted about their horses by putting images of them on their coinage, as you will see in the next paper. Some 700 lead tablets inscribed with evaluations of horses owned by the Athenian cavalry during the fourth and third centuries BC have been dug up in Athens. They record the name of the owner, the horse's color, the brand, condition, care, obedience, and speed. And I show you as an example the bronze Artemisian horse and jockey, about which Sean Hemingway knows much more than I do, with its um, brand on the horse's hindquarters. We know from these texts, these tablets, and elsewhere that the axe and the ox head were Thessalian brands. There were other brands like a Nike, as you see here, a dolphin, birds, Thunderbolt, centaur, trident, bridle, helmet, club, snake, lioness, lyre, triton, and Cerberus, the hound of hell. Prices of horses in the 5th century BC were about 400 drachmas. In the 3rd century, they went up to about 700. For comparison, a uh, day's wage for skilled labor in the 5th and 4th centuries was one drachma. Strepsiades, a character in Aristophanes' play, The Clouds, complains that his son has long hair, he rides horses, and he dreams about horses, while he, the father, has to pay the bills. <laughs> and he owes a man 1,200 drachmas for one of his son's horses. Sounds all too familiar to me. Xenophon, in the second half of the 5th century and into the early 4th century, was an Athenian who um, was a mercenary soldier, a philosopher, a hunter, and a farmer. His manual on horsemanship was written for young men training for the cavalry, and he told them how to buy a horse, how to stable it, groom it, ride it, train it, and hunt. The first of many English translations of his book came out in London in 1771. Here's what Xenophon tells us. I want to show you here, Thessaly. Everyone agreed that Thessaly had the finest horses. The best ones were 14 to 15 hands tall, and a hand is four inches. They had good horses, had sinewy forelegs, fleshy forearms. Longer cannon bones grow to be larger horses, Xenophon adds. 
Ahorus was thought to be in his prime at the age of six. The hooves should be thick-walled, the pasterns and the fetlocks flexible. Legs should be widely set to provide a strong base. Supple knees, the chest neither too narrow nor too broad. A horse's back should be short, the hocks set back, the shoulder large and broad. Xenophon liked high withers and a double ridge of muscle along the back to give the rider a better seat, more comfortable seat. A broad, deep barrel, supple loin, large, broad hindquarters, a small flank. All this, he says, makes it easier for a horse to lift his forehand and get his hindquarters under him. Broad, muscular hindquarters also give agility and speed. Xenophon suggests that horse's neck should be upright, slender near the jaw, not too short. He likes a high pole with good flexion, delicate head and jaws, small ears, small cheek, flat nose, wide nostrils, and small teeth. You could just take this along to the market and pick out the proper horses, I think. The eyes should be large and prominent and bright. He likes small ears. The tail should be thick at the base and long, held high, he said is best. Here we get to the Parthenon frieze again. The reforms of Solon in the century before, in the 6th century in Athens, graded citizens by their wealth. Horse owners were in the second of five classes. And besides a horse, they had to own 300 measures of wheat, which implies that they also had to have the property to grow the wheat. The cavalry had to shield their own infantry, scout out the enemy, skirmish, harass, pursue their foes. They also prevented, uh, or provided magnificent uh, displays during the Panathenaic Festival, which is a kind of event that we see on the Parthenon frieze. And these are the things that the cavalry do. The horse whose movement is suspended in the air, says Xenophon, is so beautiful, admirable, and amazing that it rivets the attention of young and old alike. Gods and heroes are shown riding such horses, and the men who ride them will also look magnificent. Is that what the Parthenon Frieze is all about? It shows groups of cavalrymen from each of the ten Athenian tribes. Although Greek horses were compact and relatively small, were they as small as they appear here on the Parthenon Frieze? Of course, in order for the subject to fill the frieze, the heads of the horses and the men all had to be at about the same level. And the design of the frieze took precedence over the actual appearances of horses and riders in real life. Xenophon says that, oops, sorry, when you're buying your horse, check the teeth, first of all. Here we go. Check the teeth. See that he accepts the bit and the bridle readily and is easy to mount. Does he have a soft mouth? Does he go well in both directions? Can he run, stop, and turn quickly? Xenophon says, definitely avoid a horse that is vicious. Too spirited a horse doesn't make a good war horse either. And, Xenophon warns, a disobedient horse is not only useless, he can also be a traitor. Remember, these were cavalry horses and you trusted your life to your horse. If he bolts, he could get you and himself hurt. Aesop tells a really good story about bolting. There's a young man riding a horse. He thought he was pretty good. Um, but he was unable to control the horse once he got on. The horse felt his weight and took off. Nothing would stop him. A friend of the riders met him and called out, where are you off to in such a hurry? The rider pointed to his horse and replied, 
I've no idea, ask him. <laughs> Xenophon says to see that horses have enough to eat and are in good condition, that they're well behaved and they don't kick, and that their hooves are in good shape. This is where the groom comes in. Not the halter at a point where the horse, when tied, will not rub the knot and give himself a sore. Does your horse spill his feed? That's not good. When grooming, wash his head, but leave the forelock there to protect the eyes. Don't clean the legs or the belly too thoroughly because it can irritate the skin. Greek horses weren't shod. Prepare them to walk on paved roads, Xenophon says, by filling the paddock with round stones the size of a fist and weighing about a pound each. Make sure that the stall floor isn't wet or slippery. It should have a slope to drain off the damp. The stall should be cleaned every day and be paved with stones about the size of a hoof. This will harden the hoof and toughen the frog within. The groom should gentle the horse, make him easy to handle, lead him through crowds, and get him used to all kinds of sights and sounds. If a colt shies, show him patiently not to be afraid. Good advice, which Xenophon later reinforces, saying never to get mad at a horse. And again, be patient, he says, if he's afraid of something. Hitting a horse only makes things worse. And if you've ever ridden a horse, you'll know that that's the truth. Teach your horse to go on a loose rein, neck up, and flexed at the pole. This is how he goes on his own when he's having a good time or when he wants to impress other horses, especially mares. Train the horse by pulling on his mouth just enough that he raises his neck, then release the pressure as a reward. Eventually, he'll carry his head high on a loose rein. Never pull his head up, because then he can't see where he's going. Lead your horse from the side, and always put a muzzle on him so he won't bite you. This was a surprise to me, but then most of us don't deal with stallions, and the Greeks did not geld their horses. The only reason I knew for muzzling a horse was to keep him from eating too much or too quickly. Xenophon is very specific about how to bridle a horse. Bridle him from the near side. First, put the reins over his head. Then, with the crown piece in your right hand, hold the bit in your left hand. Put it in his mouth while inserting your left thumb between the bars of his mouth. Finally, put the crown piece in place. You can see that I'm struggling with this here and trying to bridle Juniper, not doing it correctly. Jointed snaffles were widely used as bits in classical Greece, but they were a lot tougher than what we usually see today. At Dover Saddlery, I was hard pressed to find any bits that were not snaffles. The, the staff seemed a little surprised when I asked if I could pull out their most severe bits. But the Greeks were not taking any chances. Xenophon, of course, prefers smooth bits to harsh ones. But he suggests training the horse in a rough bit with discs and spikes so that the horse will not take hold of the bit. Once he's used to the rough bit, he should behave just as well in the smooth snaffle. That's definitely true today, too. Don't approach your horse from directly in front or from directly behind him. Horses see better to the sides. Don't do anything suddenly. A groom will teach your horse to kneel for you to get on. And he should also know how to give you a leg up. But you still ought to know how to vault onto your horse. Remember, there weren't any stirrups. And this is also a good reason to have a 14 to 15 hand horse, a small horse. It's not as far to grab your spear and vault on. So you mount on the near side. 
and don't jerk on the bit. Grab the mane or use your spear to vault on. Don't knee the horse in his back, but bring your leg all the way over. You should also learn to vault on from the far side. After mounting, sit still. Make your horse stand still till you ask him to walk. Don't let him fidget. Lean forward when the horse starts forward. Lean backwards when he stops short. Keep your legs under you, grip with your thighs, and let your lower legs hang. Keep your upper body supple. Don't do anything suddenly. He repeats this several times. Increase the horse's speed slowly. If he starts off too quickly, calmly bring him back. Restrain him. Click your tongue to get him going. And the trumpet or the call to battle should not alarm your horse. That's certainly true. For cavalry training, at the trot, circle to the left, give him a signal to canter, and he raises his left foot, leading with that hoof. Working in a figure eight pattern helps the horse become accustomed to turning in both directions. Check him on the turns and do not lean into the turn or maybe he'll fall over, not a good thing. Don't give mixed signals by checking him when he springs forward as he comes out of a turn. If, you're like, if your horse likes to go fast, keep him within limits. Give him his head and he'll think he's free of the bit and move freely. Spirit, courage, strength, and flexibility are the marks of a good cavalry horse. Be sure to praise him for good behavior. He'll be much easier to handle if you do it that way. Can you use your crop on your horse? Xenophon says that in battle, a shy horse may throw his rider and leave the rider in a very difficult situation. This horse is your transport in battle. You entrust your life to him. Going uphill and downhill, Running downhill will not dislocate a horse's shoulders, as some people seemed to think. Teach him to gallop uphill and down and along a slope, jump over an obstacle, jump out, jump down. When jumping a ditch or riding on a steep slope, take hold of the mane so as not to pull on the bit. If the horse doesn't know how to jump, dismount and walk over the ditch, asking him to jump it. If he refuses to jump it, someone should whip him from behind. Then mount him and try again, spurring him when he should jump. His body should be collected, not stretched out. Avoid the shy ones, the lazy ones, and those with hard mouths. The best war horses were collected and balanced Xenophon cautions that not all horses have the strength and the spirit for advanced work. When your horse brings his hind legs under him, pull him up with a bit so that he bends on his hocks and lifts his forehand. Then give him his head so he thinks he's doing it all on his own. When your horse performs beautifully, end the lesson right away. Xenophon describes a kind of pesade, a very collected and rhythmic canter from which the horse can easily make a half turn or a circle. What he expects of the best Greek war horses is retained in modern dressage. Advanced training reflects natural instincts. The horses enjoy their work, they are taught with patience, and they are congratulated when they do well. Hunting keeps your seat firm and lets you use your weapons in all sorts of terrain. Some of the great heroes of mythology, Peleus, Meleager, and Atalanta, hunted the huge boar in the territory of Caledon, a very popular subject in Athenian uh, vases of the 6th century BC. At Vergina in Macedonia, the royal hunt with boar, lions, bears, and deer help to define one's ability to rule. 
This is a painting on the facade of a fourth century royal tomb discovered in the 1970s, and it shows this kind of royal hierarchy with men and dogs. The more clothing you have on, if you're riding, the more important you are. The main um, animal to be hunted by the king, of course, would be the lion. The two hunters in the right center of this painting, if you can make it out, this is a reconstruction, those are the most important. They're on horseback, they're hunting a lion, and they're clothed. The best known cavalry commander in the ancient world was Alexander the Great of Macedonia, where that tomb was found. His Thessalian horse, Bucephalus, or bull-headed, was legendary. Alexander's father, Philip II, bought the horse for 13 talents, or 78,000 drachmas. The stallion was branded with a bull's head, a horse shown on coins issued by one of Alexander's successor may be a reference to that famous war horse, Bucephalus. When Alexander's father, Philip, first saw the horse, it was throwing everybody that tried to get on him. Alexander said those men didn't have any experience with horses, so Philip said, you ride the horse or pay me the cost. Alexander took the reins. Apparently somebody had succeeded in bridling the horse. He turned the horse to face the sun so that he couldn't see his own shadow, ran alongside him and vaulted onto his back, keeping him in check but not pulling on the reins, just as Xenophon um, suggests is the best way to do it. Eventually he gave him his head and urged him forward. Then he turned and came back. The horse stopped and Alexander dismounted. Philip said then, Macedonia is too small for my son. He needs a bigger empire. It's no wonder that Alexander was said to be descended from Heracles who had tamed the mares of Diomedes and that Bucephalus was descended from those mares. Macedonian pastures made for great cavalry, a fact that was highlighted on local coinage promoted in the early 5th century BC. Here you see a warrior leading his horse. This bronze statuette from the Roman city of Herculaneum shows Alexander wearing a royal diadem cuirass, a short cloak, and his military sandals. The blade of his sword is lost, but the sheath is belted in place beneath Alexander's left arm. He held the reins, which are now missing, in his left hand. Bucephalus has gathered his hind legs under him, and his hocks are low to the ground in a position like the modern pezade. He wears a bridle decorated with silver rosettes and a saddle cloth attached with a girth and a breastband. No stirrups. When the farrier asked me one time what has changed since Greek times, besides he's putting shoes on my horse at great expense, we decided that some of the details are different. The shoes, stirrups, we tend not to use such severe bits. Why we ride has changed and what we wear, though why we ride and what we wear changes frequently in modern times, but not the horses and not the best ways in which to handle horses, train them and make them your allies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol, that was great. Our next speaker may inspire you to take up a new hobby of coin collecting. Dr. Uta Wartenberg Kagan of the American Numismatic Society joins us next. Dr. Kagan has been the executive director of the ANS since 1991. Her research interests focus on early archaic coins and the economy of Greece. You can see some really fantastic examples from her collection in this exhibition. They're like little gems, although seeing the details blown up on the screen here might be a little easier than seeing the objects themselves. They're so tiny. 
Uh, horses are a very common motif on ancient coins, and they appear in a variety of different ways. Today, Dr. Kagan is going to examine uh, the reasons behind this enduring popularity. Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction, in fact, for the opportunity to speak and come here for the first time, see this wonderful exhibition. So I'd like to uh, thank Peter uh, for the invitation. And um, following Carol's talk, I'd like to start with a quote from Xenophon. Indeed, a prancing horse is a thing so graceful, terrible, and astonishing that it rivets the gaze of all beholders, young and old alike. At all events, no one leaves him or is tired of gazing at him so long as he shows off his brilliance. And this is indeed how one feels and how it felt when I looked over the hundreds of coins um, that have horses on them. Putting together a selection for a short talk like this is a challenge and a pleasure at the same time. And by sharing my thoughts about a few of the coins, which were minted over a period of almost a thousand years, so I'm starting in about 630 BC up to the third century AD, I hope I give you some insight into why and how a horses depicted. Horses are the most popular animal on ancient coins, and as the exhibition on horses here uh, in Greek art shows, the Greeks were clearly obsessed with their horses. It is therefore not surprising to find a few already on the earliest coins, electrum coins, shown here. In the archaic period from about 640 BC onwards, when the earliest coins were struck, they show a huge variety of designs so that we have virtually hundreds of different emblems on ancient coins, on these early coins. As a medium, because of their round shapes, but also their function, they resemble gems and seals. And we saw just earlier uh, in Schoenstock one of these seals. But in their function, they also uh, resemble the shields. Um, since some of identity of an owner or the issuer is being expressed through an emblem. Uh, the similarity between early coins and shields is someone's sometimes quite striking. Um, as you can, for example, see here um, on this line here where you have an actual, um, looks like a shield on a coin, or at least sort of the idea of imitating such a shield. Even for the actual designs on coins, um, such as here in the so-called Athenian Wappenmünzen, a German term actually referring to the emblems here, we find close parallels on shields um, for some of the really rather odd designs that we find uh, on coins. And here, this is one of the one that always puzzles people, the hind of a horse, um, but which is mirrored on um, this vase here from Auckland. Coin designs begin to change when the designs on coins begin to associate with the emblems, or in Greek the word is episematon, of a city or a person. Here the famous symbols are the owl of Athens, um, Aegina and a turtle, and then maybe one of the closest one we have, uh, Teos in Asia Minor and its colony Abdera, where you have a griffin and in both cases it is always that in Teos, the griffin always goes to the right and in the colony to the left, so they're clearly connected here. Um, but then also puns on the name, like here, a piece of some celery plant, which in Greek is the word is um, selinon, and the city is called selinus. And Corinth, one of the earliest coins here, of course, coming back to horses, um, we have the famous Pegasus already mentioned. The earliest of these depictions from about 500 BC onwards where the city uses this famous horse as one of the mythical, many mythical horses uh, in, in that we're going to see in Greek mythology. 
In the late archaic period, um, more elaborate scenes, not just a single um, animal or so, are shown and they begin now. The motif of the horseman, sometimes armed with the spear, um, becomes increasingly popular. And the city or regions that issue coins with this scene are from about 520 to 460 BC. On the slide, we have uh, Jela, Syracuse, the Macedonian king um, Alexander, with this little cute dog, as well as um, Samelia, again, with the dog motif. Um, not always riding the horse, also walking with the horse, which you already see here, of the Macedonian city of Ignai as well as not always a actual man, but also um, already mentioned before, Poseidon um, looking very similar, but here you see it's a trident that is being held. Throughout their city, the two city of cities of Jela and Syracuse, both in Sicily, were closely aligned and in the late sixth century, both were governed by the same aristocratic family. Jela was ruled by Hippocrates initially, who died in 491 BC, and Jelon, the commander of the cavalry, then took control of the city. Little is known about um, Jelon, except as tyrant of Jela, except that he was perhaps the victor in a chariot race at Olympia in 488, although there's some debate. This is information from the much later travel writer Pausanias. Half a decade later, Jelon took over the city of Syracuse as well, leaving his brother as tyrant of Jela. Whereas Athens underwent major reforms under Cleisthenes in the late 6th century, which brought an end to tyranny as a form of government, in Sicily, in particular in Syracuse, tyrants continued to rule on and off for over two centuries. Lavish expenditures for all things aristocratic were therefore normal, and horse breeding, sports, and other activities were very much part of Sicilian culture. Horsemen thus fit well as badges of Jela and Syracuse, as well as other um, Sicilian city, and I had to really cut out a lot here. Um, but they were not just engraved by regular artists, but by the very best that money could buy. In fact, uh, signed, as we're going to see. Pindar, who composed many victory oaths for the patrons in Greece and elsewhere, described Syracuse in the opening line of the Pythian Ode II as mighty city of Syracuse, where Ares dwells in depths of war, where men and horses, and there's an interesting word, they excited in iron, maybe um, actually biting the, the bit itself, have holy nurture. This is sort of the connection of Syracuse as the whole city. How skilled and effective the cavalry, cavalry of the Syracusans was, even a century later, became very clear in the ill-fated Sicilian expedition in 415 to 13, when the Athenian famously faced the 1200 Syracusan cavalry in, in the um, disaster that, that ensued. In Pindar's Odes, a fine line separates sport from war, where successful, successful victors are often also military commanders. Hieron I, Jelon's brother and successor as tyrant of the Syracusans, won both chariot races at Olympia and Delphi, but was also the commander, as we can see here, um, at the Battle of Cumae against the Etruscans in 474 BC. And this Etruscan helmet in the British Museum today um, is a, an offering at Olympia with an inscription that relates to this battle um, by Heron. It's a vivid reminder of this battle, but also the connection again here. If we now return to the iconography on coins, we see similar designs which can be interpreted as sport or war. The horseman or the horse-drawn chariot, which we're going to see, um, which Syracuse also used on its early coins. And here, um, just one example, we're going to see more. 
And I chose this one because in particular here on Jela you can see a very similar garment, um, which is clearly not warlike, but um, that we have in the famous uh, Delphi charioteer as well. The three large Panhellenic games at Olympia, Delphi, and Nemea presented athletes with an occasion to compete, which would have had their origins in such funeral games as already mentioned for the Greek hero Patroclos, um, described in the Iliad in Book 24. Some of the details on the coins indicate a horse race, um, as you can see here. So this is the sort of type of event that would have happened. Undoubtedly, the most famous event of the eight um, different events that one could compete in at Olympia in, in the Olympic Games was the um, Tethrypon. It's a chariot drawn um, for horses, which was primarily a sporting event, um, it is believed. Um, I'm no horse person, but um, I believe it's difficult to do that in battle. The charioteer stood on an open chariot and some of the earliest description here from outside uh, Sicily, and, and this is really one of the more remarkable ones, certainly on a coin, um, which is sort of reminiscent of uh, some other material that we know more from sculpture, but on coins this is unique. It's a unique coin in the British Museum. Um, is from Chalcus, the island of Euboea. Um, another chariot very early seen here is from uh, Olynthos, probably in Macedonia. Long has been believed to be connected here to this early Syracusan uh, coin, but it is not clear this is really the case. On the famous coins from Syracuse, on which the motif of a quadriga and a charioteer is standard throughout the 5th and 4th centuries, the moment shown is both one of racing but also one of victory. Since a small victory figure can be seen here flying over the horses here and crowning them. It also shows how um, basically how elaborate this is on these very small coins. To remind you, you know, these objects are all about that big. So you're seeing them here so big on the screen, but um, you can see exactly how they were yoked in the, with the different types here. They're holding a, um, a whip, a long whip here. And later on, also, you have the difference here, and this is again a debate in, in you know, who is actually the winner here. Um, in, in the Pindaric Odes, it's often to the person that owns the horse. Um, it's the horses themselves at the beginning, but then it becomes the charioteer that is being uh, crowned here. And um, the, the artistic detail here, I cannot go really into this here. It's really quite amazing um, how things are being depicted. Um, and some of these coins, um, coming back to these expensive artists here, they're holding a little, um, the victory holds a little um, sort of tablet, and actually that is the name of the artist is on that, um, in this particular case here. Other sports uh, at Olympia, the famous mule racing introduced first in Olympia in 500 BC. Uh, shows how all sorts of chariots and horses event gained popularity in, in that period. On the coins of Messana, we see how mules were raced. The charioteer actually here sits on a much larger cart. Um, see that here and with these sort of legs slightly up. Um, and the other sport that we have is the so-called kalpi. Um, which was a sport where you were riding on the horse and at the end jumping off the horse and running along. Um, it was more sort of like a trotting probably, otherwise hard to imagine how that worked. And we have this here also on coins of Calendaris, this scene where they jump off or here on the coins um, of Hemera. Like up, um, the Apini, the mule cart racing Kalpi, which was introduced in 496 BC, was discontinued sometime in the middle of the 5th century, 5th century as an Olympic sport. So it was a short period and shows the popularity of this large numbers of sports. 
But not all sports were represented in the big games of Olympia or Delphi. Thessaly, already mentioned, uh, to this day a region of wide open plains, was renowned for its outstanding horses and cavalry. Here, a sport known as the Tauro Katsapsia, this is the catching of a, uh, of a bull, um, or bull wrestling, can be seen in the various stages here on, on coins of the Federacy of Thessaly or Larissa. And what we see here is basically how we imagine this. It starts off with the um, bull running along and the horse, um, again, jumping off the horse. And then with, you see it here with a sort of um, something holding it, wrestling this to the ground by lifting the um, bull's uh, uh, feet off the ground and the horse is usually running along with the loose rein and we have literally hundreds of different designs of this in various stages here, it's just a very small selection. Um, the execution of the horses here, this is one of my absolute favorite um, depiction, this is a coin uh, that weighs uh, two grams, it's, it's, it's incredibly small that coin and when you see how the engraving on, on that coin is, it's just uh, amazing. In fact, um, coming back to this coin here, I'll come, I'll come to this, hang on one second. Here, just a very short overview of um, these coins of Thessaly. It's, it's an area that I started off in numismatics, and you have um, both horsemen, everything in Thessaly is horse, and they go down to the level where the hoof is being uh, shown. Uh, this coin here, um, I just I can't I, I just have to tell that the former owner, a, a dear friend of mine, known as uh, generally as BCD, described this in the catalog when he decided to sell his collection as as close to perfection as any classical coin can be, and someone ag agreed and paid one hundred seventy five thousand dollars for this very small piece. <laughs> so. Um, but returning for a moment here to the quadriga and horse raising, it is noticeable, noticeable that only uh, Syracuse continues this motif, which was so popular in the Hellenistic period. Outside the Greek world in India, and here the Bactrian uh, ruler Plato, very uh, rare ruler, very rare coin, you have this um, quadriga in a facing position that you see here. And the only quadrigas but not horses that we have as victory symbols actually pulled by elephants um, is um, in Alexander's uh, successor, Seleucus I. So the horses there of less interest as a quadriga, but um, turning for a moment as I was going to include something, how this develops in the Roman period here, which is of course when we quadriga and horse racing through um, all sorts of famous Hollywood movies, have um, contributed some very memorable scenes. <coughs> a quadriga with Jupiter as a charioteer can be seen here at the very beginning of Roman coinage, where we have it as a victory symbol, but then it becomes very ceremonial um, in the imperial period. And the interesting thing here is that on coins, um, horses and quadrigas are all incorporated as actually depicting a building. So what we have here is um, triumphal arches, which traditionally we know had um, such a horse quadriga and a style, which of course in Europe in the 18th and 19th century became extremely popular in many of the big European cities. But um, we have them here on coins themselves, where, so you don't have actually this, the victory of symbol symbolism here is that it, you have the building itself and here an actual temple and this here is the <coughs> quadriga, so you know, very fine, small designs. Um, the symbolism of the emperor, and this is a very shortened version of what we have in Roman, but really comes down to um, the famous emperor Constantine. Um, here when you see um, by his, one of his sons, you have the hand of God holding out to him while he goes to heaven um, in a quadriga. That's the sort of where it ends in, in effectively with the end of the, in the Christian period. 
But to come to the most famous horse of antiquity, which was undoubtedly um, Bucephalus, the Thessalian horse, um, already mentioned um, as having been bought for the staggering sum of 13 talents, um, enormous sum of money. Um, nobody had been able to tame it, except the, as, um, the famous episode in Plutarch about Alexander. And the popularity of this horse um, for actually for a very long time um, is, is goes, comes down to the third century. We have Bucephalus being worshipped on coins in the very early portraits. Um, this tetradrum here of Seleucus I has actually a, the horse itself um, shown like a human being, um, which is extremely unusual. We also have here the um, other extremely famous scene where we have here Alexander the Great um, with his horse Bucephalus attacking um, an elephant. And um, I won't go into this in detail. Most people think of this as the Indian King Porus. Um, I think it's more a Persian scene. It's his own uh, lecture, which I actually gave at the um, Pergamon um, Symposium. And here on the other side, we see the outcome of the scene is uh, Alexander wins because he is standing here holding a thunderbolt and what's missing on this specimen here a little bit is a victory figure crowning him. It's again that victory scene. Um, other other um, scenes here we have the um, Alexander again on his horse on a very rare coin and here on a made much later show how popular also the myth of the taming was. We see here Alexander taming um, the horse on a coin of the Macedonians um, in the third century AD. Um, the, when you think of the, the, how Bucephalus was famous, how he died, he apparently had an elaborate funeral that was arranged for him. It was really treated like a warrior um, in his own right. And we see here the deification of an animal which mirrors that of his master, Alexander the Great. Before Alexander, few human living beings were ever depicted, in fact, on Greek coinage, not at all. Um, and this was a medium reserved for gods and heroes. After Alexander's death, ruler cult and portraiture developed in all sorts of media, and coins now show increasingly heads of the ruler himself. Um, the fact, therefore, that Bucephalus here um, on the top left takes the place of an obverse of a coin, just as if he were a ruler, illustrates the anthropomorphism which the Greeks applied to horses. And um, there's a very interesting study um, by Ryan Platt on uh, horses on Homer and early lyric poetry in connection to Indo-European poetry, in which he argues quite convincingly that the horses are the only animals that can be they are sort of viewed by the Greeks such as humans. Um, since just um, the, the particular women, and it's often in a sexual context, are likened to horses. And there's a famous passage in the poet Anacreon about a chorus uh, about them, a, a, a woman, a girl described like a Thracian filly. It's a very famous passage. Or Alcman's chorus of young girls who explicitly are compared to fancy race horses. Horses have therefore quasi-human traits as well. According to several ancient writers, mares are extremely vain, and they're obsessed with their hair. Um, in order to breed therefore a mare, if you want to have the, the famous mules, it's a donkey with a, you, it says you have to cut the mane because um, the mare is so full of airs and it will not deal with the donkey and therefore it's, it's, it's very interesting how human these horses are made in all these different um, uh, descriptions and this is mainly in literature but in, in, on the coins it is actually also visible this particular phenomenon. So with this concept of anthropomorphic horses and actually hippomorphic humans um, as it's put there, um, the various mythical horses of the Greek appear perhaps less weird as they might to us um, just as Achilles, for example, has a mother and a mortal as a father, and we have such horses, and here is the, um, the horse, actually it's Arreon, it's, 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 um, Heracles' horse was born by Demeter, 
when she tried to avoid Poseidon, and so she decided, perhaps not very cleverly, didn't know that Poseidon is so close to horse, that she turned herself into horse, and so did Poseidon. And we have this, this very famous horse that in the city of Selpusa in Arcadia is on the coins. And of course, Poseidon, it was already mentioned here, we see um, one of the one of the famous horses in Sicily is Scyphos, and um, Poseidon just threw his trident in a rock, and you see here the horse comes out, and this is part of the rock. The coin is a little dark, but it's just jumping out of the rock here. And um, I already mentioned the, um, these terrifying horses of the Thracian king uh, Diomedes, which ate human flesh um, with the one of the eighth famous labor of Heracles. Um, a not particular appealing um, scene, nevertheless, um, we find quite commonly um, here on coins, uh, um, where here you see the dead warrior um, king on the ground and him uh, leading off the horses, as is here on an um, extremely small coin, a diable of um, Tarentum. The ultimate horsemen, of course, um, are the Dioscuri, um, which are often, very often shown on Hellenistic and Roman coins. They're usually on horseback, um, recognizable by their famous caps and stars uh, above them, which indicates their place, of course, is the star in the constellation um, Gemini. Um, their popularity must be due to their representation as warriors and helpers on the battlefield. Um, therefore also symbolizing victory. Um, and this sort of a replacement of the quadriga type is, 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 these, is the Dioscuri, which we have here, particular on uh, Seleucid coins, we have them, and then here in Bactria, again in India, um, as well as on Roman coins quite frequently. And you have, have this very charming scene here on a um, Republican coin um, where the horses uh, drink drink water. So it just, there's a lot of playfulness in all this. <coughs> no mystical horse creature shows, however, a more perfect symbiosis between men and animal than the centaurs, half horse, half men, who were believed um, to roam in Thessaly and other northern region. Um, they're part of the uh, Dionysiatic myth. They're found on some of the earliest <coughs> coins of Thrace, where you have here a centaur carrying off a nymph. Here, their wild, aggressive nature is dominant, um, which is how they're usually shown on these early coins. However, um, Chiron, the famous mentor of Achilles, is more often depicted in particular in the Hellenistic periods and onwards. Um, known as a healer, as a musician, um, you see him here holding a, a lyre of some sort. Um, he's often shown with this branch here, and here is a little owl for his wisdom, symbolizing this. Um, his popularity as an emblem on coins might well be in contrast to the more tumultuous times of the late Hellenistic periods or the crisis of the third century AD. And this is one of these coins of Gallienos um, when things really um, weren't that good. And you have very frequently a centaur on one these Roman coins. It's time to uh, sum up. And horses on Greek coins, um, and I could unfortunately only go in a few ones. I showed this to a few numismatists, and they were upset I left out their favorite coins. But you can see, um, in particular here, I left out these spectacular coins from Africa that show the Pegasus, as well as all the Celtic imitations um, and such things. Um, and there's a whole lecture in itself on the famous series of horsemen on the coinage of Tarentum. Um, coins, as you've seen a little bit now, as I can show you in this, um, are extremely popular in the archaic and classical period, in particular in regions where there were tyrants or kings ruled, so Macedonia, Sicily, and so on. Although Athens had clearly a very strong tradition um, for horsemanship as well, which is 
evident that you know you have them on the Parthenon in the frieze and in, in just endless other depictions. The conspicuous consumption associated with horse breeding uh, was frowned upon. In the Greek world, humans and horses are viewed as similar to each other, which is evident on how both are depicted as idealized and very beautiful on coins. Just as keeping horses was expensive, the more elaborate designs done by some of the famous artists in Sicily and Thessaly showed the desire to use the coins to show off a city and its wealth. And in the Hellenistic period, horses with some rare exceptions become slightly less popular, but the quadriga continues to be used to advertise victories. Um, and we continue to look at them at, to this present day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kagan. Uh, now we have an opportunity for some Q&A with our morning speakers. So um, Dr. Matouche, Dr. Hemingway, you can come back up here. Um, we do have a microphone for anyone in the audience who does have a question, so we'll be able to hear what you would like to ask. Yes, that was in reference to the uh, Diplon crater, the uh, geometric crater in its collection, and the procession of horses. Uh, and the three horses are represented in this early period. It's, uh, well, it's interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit un, I, I think it is a bit unusual to have three horses. Achilles. Yeah. Which has just said that Achilles has three horses. It's therefore special. I normally have two. Yep. So in, in that scene, we, it, as I was talking about a little bit, we don't know whether it's a, a mythological uh, scene to, a, to a myth, an earlier Homeric uh, scene or, or a contemporary scene of uh, races in honor of the deceased. So it's a good, it's a good question. It's an unusual point. Take one back here, and then city it is there is a tendency um, for them to go only in one direction and um, I think generally left is more popular but I have to admit that I would have to do a whole um, statistical study on this <laughs> to answer this correctly yes uh, I had a question uh, I want to compare uh, the Bronze Age of India, where some of the early uh, Vedic uh, literature was composed. Uh, there's a mention of twin gods called Ashwini Kumar. And Ashwa in Sanskrit means horse. And the concept of the Eskuri in uh, Persian uh, context. Uh, can we throw some light on this? Um. There's definitely the article I referred to by Aran Brat actually goes into this very material you're referring to. I read this, but I'm not a specialist at all. But um, the idea was that there might be a connection between um, you know, the very early horses and, for example, the depiction in the Homeric ones. Um, I, I, I think there is a connection, but I have to say I'm not a specialist. On, on this, but I recommend you, I can give you the reference to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, 
thank you to all of you. I've learned a lot this morning. And, and one of the things I've never seen before, and I've actually studied quite a lot of this, I've never seen anything where you have um, Neptune being closely associated with horses. Um, can you maybe speak a little bit more to that? And, and just why, why is that association of, you know, kind of, you think of the king of the sea, the god of the sea, uh, with horses, which are very much a land animal? Um, it's a good question. Uh, it is one of his, uh, what, Poseidon or, or, or Neptune is it's one of his attributes, so they're quite different. Um, but uh, but it is a, a, an old association with, with, with Poseidon. want to add to this I think you know when you when we look at the the canon of Olympic gods as we know it today um, you know you have these in fact you have this for almost every god that you have completely different often contradictory traits that don't seem to make a lot of sense and Poseidon uh, in particular in Thessaly is where I studied it most um, is very much um, in that area um, and it isn't actually even seen as as a connected to the sea there that much. Uh, it's purely Hippios and has a number of other epithets that all refer to horses. So at one point, in order to make sense of these stories, they get all sort of pulled together. Um, and I think, you know, we focus therefore almost like school learning is easier if you think Poseidon sea, um, but the Greeks would have probably looked at a little bit broader than we do. We have one more question back here. To the actual specimen you see here, in fact, I added material that is not in the exhibition. Um, so there were there basically were three groups um, I put together. The first group is from the American Numismatic Society's collection. The second really big one is from the uh, coin cabinet in Berlin. And then there were a few coins, many from a uh, private collection that was specializing in Thessaly that is from auction catalogs actually. So there were no coins from um, Sicily depicted. The problem with often depicting these coins is there is very little digital, in fact there's no digitization of these collections. The museum in Syracuse has a spectacular collection of uh, these coins that I know uh, that, that really are amazing. And to answer lastly, um, most of these coins I showed were made of pure silver. Um, there was, I think, maybe a gold that can be also made of gold or of what we call bronze which can be various types of copper bronze alloys depending from when they are made but so basically they're in these different denominations except and um, not denominations different types except the very early coins are made of a mixture of gold and silver just to make it more confusing and that's called electron please join me in thanking our morning <laughs>
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, um, and welcome back. Um, I'm Lou Lan Yu. I'm the Education Programs Manager at VMFA, and we're pleased to commence the second session of the Horse and Ancient Greek Art Symposium. Um, this afternoon, we ha will have three speakers present: Dr. John Oakley, Dr. Seth Pevnik, and Dr. Peter Schertz. After all of the papers are presented, we will invite the speakers back to the stage for about 10 to 15 minutes of audience questions. And our program will conclude with remarks by Nicole Stribling, who's curator of, per of permanent collections at the National Sporting Library and Museum. And she's also the co-curator of the Horse in Ancient Greek Art exhibition, which you'll have an opportunity to visit and perhaps visit again after the symposium concludes. The galleries are open until 5 p.m. today, and um, at 3 o'clock when we're through here, please um, note that we'll be going upstairs to the gallery for a visit with the curators. Well, it is my honor to introduce our first speaker, Dr. John Oakley, who will present a paper on mythological horses in ancient Greek art. Dr. O Dr. Oakley is a classical archaeologist whose main interests are Greek vase painting, iconography, and Roman sarcophagi. He is known as an expert on ancient vase painting and has taught at the College of William and Mary since 1980, where he is the Chancellor Professor and Forrest D. Merton, Jr., Professor of Classical Studies. So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Oakley. Before beginning my paper, I would first like to thank the Virginia Museum for hosting this event, and to all here in the National Sporting Library and Museum who were involved with the exhibit and symposium. So a general thank you, everybody. You've been great, and I hope it continues to be great. The most famous, <coughs> uh, the most famous horse in Greek myth is Pegasus, the winged equine who was born from the decapitated Gorgon, Medusa, along with the giant Chrysaor. Poseidon had fathered both. The birth of Pegasus is rendered already in the 6th century BC by Greek architectural sculpture, and is also shown on other media, such as a <clears throat> striking white lekythos in New York by the Diosphos painter. Medusa rendered an outline in golden dilute glaze is headless and collapses on the ground as a black pegasus flies out of the open moon. Perseus, also in black, flies away to the left carrying Medusa's head in his kibasis, that's his pouch. His harpe, the sickle which he used to cut the gorgon's head off, is in his left hand. Pegasus alone is rendered on a variety of media, including the coins of Corinth, as we've seen where he is said to have stopped his hoof on Acro Corinth, creating the Pyrene Spring. He is also rendered on coins of, the, of Corinth's colony, Syracuse. A beautiful Apulian red figure dish in the exhibit shows Pegasus in the tondo with wings spread. Later, Pegasus was changed into a constellation, which the star shown here above him may indicate. With Pegasus' help, Bellerophon was able to slay the chimera, a monster with a tail, <coughs> with a snake for a tail, and the neck and head of goat protruding from a lion's body. An early depiction of circa 650 BC of the encounter between the hero and the monster is rendered on a Proto-Corinthian Aribolos in Boston. Here the beast is on the left and the hero on his winged horse, Pegasus, on the right. The individual parts of the former are clearly rendered. Lion's body with goat's head protruding from his back 
and a snake for tail. The beast breathes fire from his lion's nose and mouth. Senethobia, the wife of King Proteus of Argos, fell in love with Bellerophon, but the hero rejected her advances. She then falsely accused him to her husband. To dispose of the hero, Proteus sent Bellerophon to Iobates, the king of Lycia, with a sealed letter containing a secret message to kill Bellerophon. For this reason, Iobates commanded Bellerophon to perform a number of deeds, including killing the chimera all of which the hero performed successfully with the help of Pegasus. Iobates, realizing that he was defeater, defeated, later gave his daughter in marriage to Bellerophon along with half his kingdom. And Napoleon red figured Stamnos by the Ariadne painter is one of several South Italian vases showing the handing over of the letter to Bellerophon. On the left stands Synethobia, before what may be the stage door of a theater. The scene and several others was possibly influenced by Euripides' lost play, The Synethobia. Here, she appears to encourage him to get rid of the troublemaker by touching the king's arms. Proitos, posed in the center, holding his scepter, has just handed over the letter to Bellerophon, who stands before Pegasus. The horse stomps his feet in anticipation of going. Several other South Italian red-figured vases show Bellerophon and the winged horse on their way to King Iobates, or at the delivery of the letter to him. In another version of the story, Bellerophon <coughs> returns to Tiryns, where he takes off with Synethobia on Pegasus and then deposits her in the sea. Just this moment is given on an Apulian amphora by the Gravina painter, where beneath the hero on his steed, Synethobia plunges headfirst into the sea filled with marine life. A number of other South Italian vases show Bellerophon arriving at the court of King Iobates. A calyx crater by the Darius painter is one of the best examples. In the top left corner, the hero sits upon a white-winged pegasus holding the letter in his right hand as he flies to King Iobates' court. The king sits on his bed and looks up, uh, looks up at the approaching pair, his right hand raised to his forehead as if he were a seaman, bettering his view of an approaching ship, the approaching heroes in this case. Flying horses other than Pegasus are often connected with celestial mythological figures and are shown in Greek art drawing their chariots. These include the chariots of Eos, goddess of the dawn, Selene, personification of the moon, Helios, the personification of the sun, and Nyx, the personification of the night. Sometimes their horses are winged and sometimes the divinities themselves are. A white ground lekythos of 590 BC by the Sappho painter has black figure decoration and shows three of them. In the center, in the upper half of a well-dressed chariot labeled as Helios the Sun, who holds a goad in his left hand. A sun disc sits above the god's head, and to either side of him are the protomes of four horses the outer two looking out, the inner two looking in towards the god. The viewer, by convention, is meant to understand that the rest of the figures are emerging out of the darkness of night. In the picture field above his horses are the protomes of two more chariots and drivers, Eos on the right and Nyx on the left. Dawn and night disappear as day, Helios breaks. Swirls of golden dilute are used for their bodies and the backs of their horses and chariots. Only the god's head and the four parts of their horses are fully preserved in black. A celestial disc sits above the head of each god. Heracles squats on a stream of dilute gloss emanating from Eos and her chariot as he roasts two spits before a lit altar. <clears throat> Likely he is sacrificing to Helios. Also holding claim as the most famous equine in Greek mythology is the Trojan horse, which we've already heard about in Sean's paper, which was not a real horse, but a large wooden one made by the Greeks 
to fool the Trojans into bringing it into Troy, along with the Greeks hidden inside it. Surprisingly, <coughs> despite its fame, there are relatively few depictions of the Trojan horse in Greek art. The earliest certain, and perhaps the finest, is rendered on a large storage jar of circa 670 BC in the archeological museum on the Cycladic island of Mykonos. We've already seen this too, thanks to Sean. This pithos shows the horse on one side of the vessel's neck filled with Greek warriors. <clears throat> the heads of those already inside the horse are shown in windows. Let's see where we go. There. Some of whom hold a helmet, shield, spear, spears, or sword and scabbard. One of the Greeks on the bottom right steps up on the horse's left foreleg. Two more stand on the animal's back, and others stand on the ground or ground line above. <clears throat> Multiple ground lines are a Greek convention to indicate figures who go side by side in the same procession. <coughs> Scenes from the Sac of Troy are rendered below in the panels on the body of the vase. This is the aftermath of the event image on the neck, thereby complementing it. Other well-known mythological ste steeds were the man-eating horses of Diomedes. Excuse me. <coughs> Other well-known mythological steeds were the man-eating horses of Diomedes, which Heracles had to tame as his eighth labor. These he kills or captures and feeds them to their master, Diomedes, or to their groom. The finest depiction of this rarely depicted labor is rendered on the interior of a splendid attic red figure cup by Psyax. It's the cup with its interior, and that's a detail <coughs> of Heracles and uh, one of the horses of Diomedes. And if you look carefully into the mouth of the horse, you'll see the head and arm and blood squirting out of the creature the man-eating horse is eating. <clears throat> the figures set on a short ground line float on the background of coral red gloss. This rare technique employed for covering large layers, as here, was invented around 535 BC and is also called intentional red or coral red. The hero in lion skin and kitten niskos goes left while struggling with one of the horses. He prepares to strike with the club held up in his left hand while his right arm is wrapped around the animal's neck. The steed rears back in an attempt to get away <clears throat> and in its mouth, astonishingly, can be seen the bloody head and arm of a youth, perhaps a groom. Another set of unruly mythological horses were those belonging to King Rhesus of Thrace. He came to Troy with his steeds to assist the Trojans, and he and his horses wrecked havoc for a day among the Greek forces. That night, as he and his forces slept, Odysseus and Diomedes learned the location of their camping spot from Dolan, a Trojan spy whom they had caught while out on a spying mission themselves. In the Iliad, we are told that Dolan, quote, uh, Dolan claims, quote, his Russos, his, meaning Russos's, are the finest horses I ever saw, and the biggest. They are whiter than snow, their speed of foot is the wind's speed, end quote. The earliest and finest depiction of these horses is on a black-figured Chalcidian neck amphora <coughs> of circa 540 BC by the inscription painter. Above the ground line around the entire body of the vessel sleep a row of Thracians. Only Ressos of the 13 shown is awake. So, there. So that's Ressos. And Diomedes. Diomedes holds him back by the neck and is making ready to stab him. Both Diomedes and Ressos are labored, labeled, as is Odysseus on the other side of the vase, who has already sunk his sword to the neck of one sleeping Thracian. In the Iliad, <clears throat> he does not participate directly in the killing, but is responsible for pulling the dead bodies out of the way so that he could lead the horses away. In the background hang the arms and armor of the sleeping Trajan, uh, Thracians, while by each of the handles are the agitated steeds, two on one side, four on the other. 
One is colored a bright white, while one on the other side is red. Of the four in black, two rear back on their hind legs, underscoring the equine theme of the main picture are the youthful riders Im uh, imaged on the shoulder above. So let's see if we can get that. A number of other heroes had immortal horses. Achilles had a pair of them, Balios and Xanthos, given to him by his father who obtained them from Poseidon as a wedding gift. They are named in the Iliad, book 16, lines 145 to 154, and said to have stood motionless when Patroclus was uh, slain at Troy. The vase painters, however, did not normally label Achilles' horse, horses. One of the few exceptions occurs on a fragmentary Scyphos of 560 BC, signed by Nearchus as potter and painter, and the vase is in Athens and from the Acropolis. It's a nice drawing of it by my friend Heidi Mumpson. Achilles, labeled, stands before his team of horses, adjusting the bridle <coughs> on one of them as the harnessing process continues, while his mother, Thetis, stands behind him holding the rest of his arms and armor. This is the earliest depiction of harnessing in attic vase painting, a subject that became very popular on Athenian vases during the last 40 years of the 6th century BC. Between the three horses in front, two black and one unusually colored red, and a white one further back, are inscribed the names of two of them, Kaitos, meaning main, and Eutoas from Thoas for fast. Nearchus is the first Attic vase painter to give horses names. Horses also sometimes serve as attributes of heroes, like those rendered with the Dioscuri, the brothers of Helen and sons of Leda. And the gods are often shown in various processions involving horse-drawn chariots, most notably the apotheosis of Heracles into Olympus and marriage processions, particularly that of Peleus and Thetis. Other pursuit and abduction scenes also often involve chariots. A pair of mid-fourth century Apollyon red-figured lekithoi by the underworld painter in the exhibit provides a spectacular, ex provides spectacular examples. <clears throat> a rarely depicted myth is shown on, the f <coughs> on one, the one that's on the screen, and showing the fight between the Dioscuri, that is Castor and Pollux, and the sons of uh, Aphereus, Lycinius and Idas. The, la the latter pair had been betrothed to the daughters of Leucippus, but the Dioscuri made off with the girls. The abduction of the Leucippidae by the Dioscuri is a scene shown on a number of vases, such as the masterpiece of the mightiest painter, the famous Attic red-figured Hydria of 42410 BC. But the fight between the other set of brothers is a very rare subject. On the upper zone of the body on the Richmond Lekathos, yeah. <clears throat> on the upper zone of the body on the Richmond Lekathos, the fight between the pair of brothers is shown. Idas, already wounded in the right thigh, lifts the steely, <coughs> used to mark a grave, perhaps that of his father, Aphiraeus, and over his head and is about to cast it at Pollux, who approaches with sword ready from the right. Lynceus lies dead on the right, while a wounded caster falls on the left. Zeus's thunderbolt indicates that he is coming in support of his two sons. Okay. Two chariots, each with a youthful driver, either the Dioscari is shown again or other assistants, and one of the Leucippidae frame the scene. The poses of both girls indicate their unwillingness to be abducted. The main subject on the Lekathos, other Lekathos, is Eos, goddess of the dawn, abducting Cephalos, the young Athenian hunter. The couple embrace while standing beneath the nimbus in the quadriga. A host of deities and companions fill out their register in the one below. These include Hermes, Aphrodite, and Apollo in the upper register, a Pythagogos, 
that is the older man who's in charge of the children, <coughs> Silene and others in the lower. Numerous mythological images with fighting scenes involves forces such as Amazonomachies, Gigantomachies, Aramis boy fighting griffins. The riders in these scenes are carried in a chariot or appear on horseback as on a Napoleon red figure calyx crater of the mid fourth century in the exhibit. It shows two of them on horseback fighting Greeks afoot. The left hand Amazon is about to have her throat slit while the other seems to be faring better. Recent scholarship makes a good argument that real barbarian women archers on horseback existed in the Eurasian steppes, live Amazons, so to say, who were in contact with the Greek world and were the source for their mythological predecessors. Mythological funerary games with horse or chariot races as their subject include those for Patroclus, Achilles' best friend, as on the Francois vase, the most famous of all Greek vases. In addition, a host of other scenes also show the gods and their heroes with horses and chariots. These include departure scenes, such as that of Hector, of Amphiaraeus, or of Castor and Pollux, or racing scenes, such as the contest between Pelops and Onomaus. Particularly gripping are the scenes of Hippolytus, the young son of Theseus, crashing or about to crash his chariot at the sight of the sea monster in the form of a bull sent by Poseidon to destroy. His runaway chariot appears in the lower register of a Napoleon value crater in London by the Darius painter as a white bull emerges from the ground line. A fury on the far right, uh, actually the far left, <laughs> <clears throat> or Alyssa, the personification of man and, and uh, insanity, holding up a torch, incites the bull with it. The lad's Pythagoga, Pythagogos, his attendant, approaches from the left. Gods, some connected with the action and others not, fill the upper, fill the upper register. Let us now conclude the survey by very briefly considering the four mythological hybrids who are part horse. These are centaurs, Silenes and satyrs, Hippolytrioi and hippocamps. Centaurs are by far the most popular and well known of these four and feature a human forepart and horse rear. Early on, they commonly have, commonly, commonly have a complete human body to which the barrel and back of a horse are attached, as on a as on a middle Proto-Corinthian Scyphos in the exhibit where a centaur is pursued by a man with a bow, possibly Heracles. Later, they more often are human from the waist up. The earliest certain depiction of these centaurs is the left Condi centaur, a large terracotta statue of circa 900 BC, found at the site of left Condi on the island of Euboea. And this is another piece that Sean showed us. Because of the wound on his left knee, he is thought possibly to be Chiron, who was accidentally shot there with a poison arrow by Heracles. In temperament, the centaurs were also part human and part animal. The latter is particularly evident in the centauromachy, the most common scene involving them. Neighbors to the Lapiths in Thessaly, the centaurs were invited to the wedding feast of the Lapis king, uh, Perithius. After imbibing wine, the creatures became drunk and started to make off with the Lapith women, including the bride, thereby inciting a riot. These multi-figured scenes became a popular subject for Greek architectural sculpture, including the Metopes from the south side of the, uh, the Parthenon. And there are many Attic black figure vases from the mid-sixth century on showing it. The most famous and gifted centaur was Chiron, he interacted often and well with humans, as the human clothes he normally wears indicates. In Greek art, he is most often shown as one of the observers at Peleus' abduction of the sea nymph Thetis, or during his handling of the baby Achilles, whose teacher he became. A black figure neck amphora at the Walters Art Museum and in the exhibit shows Peleus handing the small boy over to Chiron. 
But there were also centaurs whose names we do not know, <coughs> who do not act in a friendly manner. The centaur Nessos is the best example, for he agreed to aid Heracles by taking his bride Dianara across the river. When doing so, the centaur attacked the woman, and Heracles shot the centaur with an arrow. The blood from the wound, the blood from the wound was later used to kill Heracles. The name piece of the Nessos painter is one of the best examples. It's in Athens in the National Museum. The followers of Dionysus, who were called both satyrs and Silenes in antiquity, are by far the most frequently depicted hybrid, appearing on several thousand Greek vases <coughs> starting around 600 BC, as well as occurring on many other forms of Greek art. These creatures are rendered most commonly as part of the god Dionysus' retinue, but are also shown in a wide range of other things, many of which are due to the influence of satyr plays. The creatures are characterized by balding heads, pointed horse ears, stub noses, <coughs> a human bodies of various ages, and a horse's tail. And they were often ithophallic and could on occasion have horse's legs. The finest depiction of all the satyrs in the exhibit decorates the body of a red-figured lekathos by the Bowden painter. On it, a satyr goes right, looking back, a wineskin, draped over his left shoulder, a branch in the same hand, and a drinking horn extended out in the right. He's ready to party. The hippolyctrion was a cross between the front part of a horse and the back of a cock. There is no known mythological story involving this creature, but they are not uncommon in Greek and Etruscan art and are referred to in several Greek plays. The earliest certain depiction is on an attic black figured neck amphor in Bond of 570-550 BC. Sometimes the horse element is winged, as is the case in the tondo of an attic black figured cup in the exhibit. So a Pegasus cock or bird. Riders as this youth occurred as early as circa 560 BC and include also Poseidon or a warrior, but many are unidentified and youthful. The motif was popular starting around the middle of the 6th century BC and was also popular in various forms of Etruscan art. Another imaginary hybrid creature shown in mythological scenes in Greek art, but playing virtually no role in Greek myth, is the hippocamp. This sea creature has the forepart of a horse and the back part of a marine serpent. Appearing already in Minoan art, the figure is used to decorate a variety of Greek objects, including painted vases, gemstones, statuettes, coins, and metal vases. Perhaps the finest depiction is that on an attic black-figured lekathos of circa 500 BC at, the Yale, at Yale University, and the vases by the Athena painter. Seated on the creature's back is the god of the sea, Poseidon, who we can recognize by the trident he holds. He looks back towards his massive tail, where two small dolphins swim, indicating a seascape. Uh, the creature is winged here, which is not always the case. Our survey of mythological horses in Greek art has brought us into contact with many of the major Greek gods and heroes. Horses in mythological contexts, as we have observed, appear on a wide range of artistic media, although most frequently on vases of various fabrics and shapes. Famous vase painters such as Ezekias, the Nessos painter, and the Darius painter decorated some of the vases we have considered, and lesser vase painters as well, such as the Sappho painter. Myth, and thus horses and their hybrids, particularly centaurs and uh, satyrs, were depicted just about everywhere in the ancient Greek world. Simply put, horses and myth go together and often live in ancient Greek art. I thank you. Thanks. So I'm off the hook now. Thank you, John. The scepter. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're going to need that. Uh, for those of you just joining us this afternoon, my name is Nicole Stribling. I'm the curator of permanent collections at the National Sporting Library and Museum and co curator for the Horse and Ancient Greek Arts. I'm happy to introduce our next speaker,
who has joined us from sunny Florida, and some of us are wishing we could go back with you, uh, Dr. Seth Pevnik. He's the chief curator and the Richard E. Perry Curator of Greek and Roman Art at the Tampa Museum of Art. Dr. Pevnik has been curator of Greek and Roman art there since 2009 and became chief curator in 2013. He previously worked in the antiquities department of the J. Paul Getty Museum at the Getty Villa and has been involved with archeological excavations in Greece and Albania. Pevnik earned his PhD from UCLA where he studied the ancient Athenian pottery industry. His most recent projects, as some of us this morning may have heard, uh, included curating the exhibition Poseidon and the Sea, Myth, Cult, and Daily Life, which was on view in 2014. Seth and his colleagues at Tampa uh, contributed several loans to this exhibition, which I hope you all get a chance to see later this afternoon. And today, Dr. Pevnik is going to tell us about the fascinating world of equestrian competition in ancient Greece, which was an important part of the ancient Greek culture. Thank you very much, Nicole, and thank you, Peter, for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Um, as Nicole said, we lent a number of vases to the exhibition, first in Middleburg and now in Tampa, and so I haven't seen them for a long time. And it was exciting to see them upstairs in the exhibition, and I think a lot more people have seen them now than would have seen them had they stayed in Tampa. So um, it's exciting to be a part of this. Um, you can see my topic here. I'll be talking about equestrian competition. We'll start with a little bit from the world of myth following on what, what John just spoke about, but primarily looking at um, historical horse races. So we begin with, with this wonderful fragment. This is in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. And it shows the, the horse ra or the chariot race that we know happened um, at the funeral games for Patroclus. And you can see a little bit of the passage from, from Homer's Iliad that, that describes this. But what's really fascinating about this fragment is not just the horses. We can tell that they're part of a chariot team, and that's lost, unfortunately. But we have this grandstand here and all these bearded men sort of gesturing excitedly at the race that they're watching. But what makes it most remarkable are these inscriptions. So one of these guys is Achilles, Patroclus' best friend who has organized this race. And then here it says, it's written from right to left, Patroclus Atla, the, the games of Patroclus. So there's no doubt about what this mythological event is. And then the last line, in case you're interested, says Sophilos Megrafsen. So that's the inscription that identifies the vase painter. It's one of the earliest autographs that we have from an ancient Greek vase painter. Um, and at the bottom right, you can see the shape of vase that this came from, unfortunately lost. But it's an important vase shape that, that we'll return to numerous times. And then here's the, the Francois vase that Dr. Oakley just showed us. And if, if we zoom in, this is the frieze that we're interested in, the neck frieze. And it shows this same race. We're, we're still missing a little bit, but we have quite a lot more. So we can see there would have been one, two, three, four, five teams of horses racing in this race. But what I love about this depiction is that we have here a dinos, that same vase shape that we just saw, um, and here a tripod cauldron. And here at the end, we have this guy standing, and he's labeled as well. That's Achilles. So just like on the fragment that we saw before, we have the organizer of, of this race um, honoring his best friend who, who has passed, and beside him is a tripod cauldron. And if you look at the, the um, description from Homer, he tells us that among the prizes that were given are cauldrons and tripods and horses and many more. But these, these trophies of victory become just as important, we'll see, as the actual event itself. And we'll return again and again in, in the next few minutes to these symbols of victory. So that's probably the most famous equestrian competition um, in myth. But if we go to the Olympic Games, um, which we know as a historic thing, um, if, if we go back to the descriptions from Pausanias, the great um, travel writer of the second century, he tells us about the history of the games. And I'm not going to read this all to you. 
Um, but basically, he tells us that long before the historic Olympics, the heroes held games at Olympia as well. And the greatest hero of all, Heracles, organized games. And they included not just the chariot races, like the one that we saw, but also the horse race on a riding horse, which was my main topic um, for this. And so there is some, some precedent for that, even though it's fairly rare for us to see the Greek gods or the Greek heroes riding on horses. More often, in association with, chariot, or with horses, they are with chariots, as, as we've heard. Um, and then Pausanias tells us um, they, they sort of forgot about the Olympics, and they stopped having it for a while. But then, luckily, King Iphitos of Elis revived the games. And initially, all the games included were the foot race, but little by little, he tells us, they remembered some of those events that they had forgotten, and they added them back into the program. And so they added the two-lap race, and they added the pentathlon, and wrestling, and boxing. And finally, the race for fully grown horses in 680 BC, but by that he means the four-horse chariot race, which was the most prestigious equestrian competition. And it's only in 648 BC that finally the race on ridden horses is added to the Olympic program. But as, as we heard earlier today, there's plenty of material evidence linking these tripods as symbols of victory with equestrian competition. So whether they were officially sanctioned Olympic events or not, we know that uh, wealthy elites at Olympia were combining these themes of equestrians and wealth and victory together in tripods like this with horses atop them um, or scenes of athletic competition or just freestanding horses. At the same time that, that that first fragment was made, or around the same time and in the same workshop, this vessel was made. It's also fragmentary, but the same shape. And this one seems perhaps not to come from the world of myth, but perhaps from an actual historical horse race. And the reason that I say that is because we have all these great details. So we have several horsemen clearly galloping, right? They're at, at full speed, racing one another. And this is the really important part here, because we have a post here, which should be either a turning post, or a finish line, or a starting line, or maybe all three. Um, and then these tripods, again, the trophies for victory, and this guy who's standing and fully draped and with a staff. And he well, may well be the race official who says, on your marks, get set, go, um, and, and judges who the winner is. We see similar types of, of horse races in, in fairly large numbers on this type of drinking cup. This is one that's upstairs in the exhibition. It's known as a Siana cup. Um, but it's not only horse races that we see on Siana cups. We see lots of other kinds of competition as well. Um, and I love this one because it has the horse race on one side and then a gentleman carrying that tripod, again the trophy, and then within the winged goddess Nike, the, the sort of goddess of victory. So combining all three of those elements on a single cup. But we also see athletic events like wrestling um, and running. Here's a chariot race. These suddenly mushroom in popularity in the Athenian pottery industry in the third quarter, or I'm sorry, in the second quarter of the sixth century BC, um, which is noteworthy because although the Olympics were founded in the eighth century BC, it's really in the early sixth century that the other Panhellenic crown games um, come about. So we have the Pythian games at Delphi, the Isthmian games at Isthmia, and the Nemean games at Nemea, in honor of Apollo, Poseidon, and Zeus, respectively. All of those competitions include athletic events as well as equestrian events. And so it's no surprise that the producers and the consumers of pottery in that time period would be interested in, in agonistic iconography. And just to, to tell you where in the world we are, here's Olympia in the uh, western Peloponnese, and Nemea and Isthmia and Delphi, they're all within a fairly small area of Greece, um, and Athens we'll get to shortly, also not far away. Um, these equestrian competitions were held in specific areas. This is a reconstruction um, of the, the sanctuary and the complex at Olympia, but if you look carefully, you'll notice that the hippodrome, where all of the equestrian competitions were held, is missing. 
And that's because despite more than 100 years of excavation at Olympia, it has not been found. Um, we have this reconstruction that shows you, to give you a sense, this is the stadium where the foot race was held, and here it is on the diagram. The hippodrome would be much, much longer. Um, and then this detail here is based on a description from Pausanias that tells us about the starting mechanism of the hippodrome. So they would start in sort of filed ranks like this, and these horses would be released first, and then these, and these, and these, and so on, so that it's sort of a moving start that we get. And we have a turn post here, a turn post here. Some, some of the events would include multiple laps around this track. Um, and what we don't have, which is noteworthy, is no dividing wall there. And if you read some of the literary uh, accounts of equestrian competitions, we know that there were occasionally horrific head-on collisions when the horse is going this way and the horse is going this way um, ran into one another. And there again, an aerial view. So here's the running track. The hippodrome is probably up here somewhere, but, but hasn't been located or hasn't been excavated. And for many years, that was the case, not only at Olympia, but everywhere. We had no known hippodrome. Um, but in the last 15 years or so, a hippodrome has finally been located. Um, in, in 2006, I think it was first excavated. And this is at Mount Lycaon, which is not far from Olympia. You can see on the map, here's Olympia, here's Mount Lycaon. It's not nearly as famous because it wasn't the site of a Panhellenic festival, but rather a regional festival. Um, but like Olympia and like a lot of these other Panhellenic um, sites, they held athletic and equestrian competitions there. And we know that the Hippodrome has been found in part because the archaeologists have found these turning posts. Um, and what's interesting here is that the stadium lies within the area of the Hippodrome. And if you think about the, the account I just showed you from Olympia, where the stadium is this big and the hippodrome is thought to be this big, well, this is a very, very different situation. And that's partly because it's on the slopes of a mountain, right? And it's hard to find a long, flat area on the slopes of a mountain, and they have to take topography into account. Um, and all of that goes to tell us that equestrian competitions in antiquity are a little bit different from competitions today, right? If, if you go to a football stadium in one city and then a football stadium in another city, they need to be uniform, and that's part of the game. But an ancient horse race or even an ancient running race, it doesn't need to be that way. It's just whoever's the first to cross the finish line on a given track is the victor. We're gonna turn a bit now away from Olympia um, and, and focus on Athens, and the reason for that is because in Athens, there was a festival that was held every four years, the Greater Panathenaea, that was open to all Greeks. Um, it, was, it was reorganized in 566, 65 BC. And unlike at Olympia, where you just won a crown for your victory, although you might get paid by your city state or other patrons, um, at Athens, you won lots and lots of prizes. You won these prize vases that are decorated on one side with the goddess Athena, the patron goddess of Athens, and on the other side with the event in which you won. And you won lots and lots of these, and they were all full of Athenian olive oil. Way more olive oil than you could use on your own, and therefore the equivalent uh, of cash, or could it at least be converted into cash. Um, this is the earliest known Panathenaic prize vase, known as the Bergen Amphora, after its discoverer. And you can see it has an equestrian event here Two horses, or some scholars have suggested they're mules, um, pulling this guy on a cart. And this detail is the inscription here, which tells us that it's from the games at Athens. It's an official prize vase. Um, that was about 565 BC, that first prize vase. And we have lots of prize vases over the course of the next um, couple of decades. But the first prize vases, or I'm sorry, the first vases related to the Panathenaic Games that we have that show horse races of this type with people riding on horses um, come about around 540 BC. And this is one in Tampa. It's not an official prize vase because it doesn't have the inscription or the columns. But notice that Athena's shield has a tripod on it, sort of um, pounding home that idea of victory. Um, and we have these two guys riding, and you can see uh, riding crop, they're each wearing a short tunic, 
and racing across the vase. Around the same time period, we have some other vases related to the Panathenaea that, that show horses. This is a very unusual one in Paris. Um, it has Athena, again with a tripod. Here there are columns, and each has a dinos on it, that, that other kind of prize vase. Um, but the really remarkable thing about this vase is what's going on here. There's a lot going on, right? We have these spectators. Uh, one of them is, is shouting something, and it says something like, um, a, a vase for, for the tumbler or the, the jumper, something like that. And if you look, um, we've got a guy digging up the soil, a guy climbing a pole, a guy on a horse, and there are in fact two horses if you count the legs here. But the strangest thing is this guy who has two shields and a helmet, he's like a warrior, and he's either jumping on or jumping off of the horse. There, there has been quite a lot of ink spilled about this one, and I think we still don't know exactly what's going on. Um, but it reminds one a little bit of one of the coins that Uta showed earlier. Um, this is from Himera, and it shows a, a guy jumping off of a horse, which is probably that event called the Kalpe, where you ride on your horse part of the time and then you jump off and you trot alongside him for the rest of the race. So perhaps that's what we see here. And then we have this really remarkable vase. This, this one is in London. Um, and again, we have Athena, but no inscription, no columns. We have Hermes instead, and a bearded guy here. And then on the back, someone seated on a horse. He's wearing a tunic again, like the guys on the Tampa vase. Behind him, this guy's holding a tripod um, and, and a garland or a wreath. That's maybe to crown the victor. But the most remarkable part is this guy, who again has these words spilling out of his mouth. And what those words say is, the horse of Dusnikitos wins. So he's like the herald announcing the winner of the, vase, uh, of the race. Sorry. And then the question, of course, is who is Dusnikitos? Is he on the vase? He, he might be this guy behind Athena. He might be this guy carrying his own prize. Maybe he's the rider. Um, but one of the interesting things about equestrian competition in antiquity is that you didn't necessarily need to be the rider of the horse to be the winner of the race. You needed to be the owner of the horse to win the race. And you could ride it, sometimes that happened, but sometimes, as today, you owned the horse and you paid a jockey and he, he raced the horse. Similarly, we have this one, which is official, right? It's fragmentary, but we have Athena and the columns and the inscription, and here's the reverse. There's a rider on the horse, and this guy with the palm fronds, and this guy with palm fronds, and here's sort of a sash, which is often used as a sign of victory. So again, congratulating the victor, but it's unclear exactly who that victor might be. We have a similar situation on a cup that's upstairs in the exhibition. We have a rider here, and maybe this is a little sash. Maybe it's a saddlecloth, but maybe it's a sign of victory. But in any case, these guys seem to be looking on admiringly at, at the horse and rider. Curiously, we don't have a lot of equestrian sculptures that seem to relate to equestrian victory. Maybe a few, um, and, and this is one possibility. He's known as the Rampant Rider, and he's actually split between two museums. The head is in Paris, and, and the bodies of the horse and of the youth are, are in Athens. But the reason some people think this might be an equestrian victor is not only that he's riding a horse and someone made a statue of him, but that if you look carefully at his hair, he's wearing a wreath. And if you remember when I talked about Olympia and Nemia and Isthmia um, and Delphi, at each of those games, your prize was a crown. That you, might, that you might wear, um, especially if you wanted to commemorate it. And so scholars have argued, is it Nemean celery or Pythian pine, or is it something else? We, we're not quite sure. There's this great story, and I, I won't read the whole thing to you. Um, I trust you all know how to read. Um, the, the mayor of Phytalus, this is one of the most famous passages that we have that describes a race where the rider falls off the horse, the horse finishes the race, and is declared the victor. And this has, again, instigated a lot of debate among scholars about whether it's true. Um, and if it is true, what does it tell us? Um, I think Sean Hemingway 
uh, points out a lot here. It tells us that mares could compete, the weight of the jockey was important, but it wasn't regulated, um, and that the race involved at least one trumpet blast and turning of a post. So again, think about this, uh, d this diagram that we have. Um, it is thought, but, but not known for certain, that the Kellys, which is the name for the race on horseback, that it was just two laps in a race. Um, the two-horse chariot race would be longer, and the four-horse chariot race, which we'll hear about, I think, from Peter, um, was the longest and the most prestigious of all. Pausanias also tells us that not only did Phytalus win with that horse who bucked its rider, but his sons won as well. And I just realized yesterday when I was upstairs in the exhibition, the, the name of their horse is Lycos. And since I just realized this, I didn't add a slide here. But there's, there's the red figure cup upstairs by Onesimos that shows the groom grooming the horse. We saw it earlier. And if you go upstairs and look, that, that vase has an inscription, Lycos Kalos, which means Lycos is beautiful. And that may well be a reference to, to this horse, if he was so famous having won an Olympic victory. But the, the reason I include this is that we, we saw earlier these um, crowns being given and it's interesting in the literature that sometimes the horse is described as crowning its owner, sometimes the owner is described as winning the crown. The crown can move sort of in different directions. Here we see a woman crowning a horse. Here we see a rider crowning a horse, and Nike, the goddess of victory, crowning the rider. The important thing is the victory and, and the symbols associated with it. Finally, when we get to the, to the end of the 6th century, we get what I think most people would think of as a more straightforward depiction of the horse race, like this one in the Metropolitan. We see the turning post here and these guys racing at full speed. And I think it's interesting to compare this vase from about 510 to this one, which we saw earlier. Notice um, here our jockeys are clothed, here they are nude, here in comparison to the horse, either the jockeys got smaller or the horses got bigger or both. And I don't know if that's true to life. Did that actually happen as, as we move forward with um, competitive um, equestrian events or, or is this something that, that the vase painters thought more appropriate? Um, suddenly, by, by the end of the sixth, beginning of the fifth, we get lots and lots of these. Um, here we have a race official. He's got this big stick. If you committed a foul, you, you were um, liable to get slapped with the stick by the race official, not only in equestrian competition, but athletic events as well. Here we've got two riders, one with his crop raised, another with it down. A very similar one in Toronto. And then this one that's upstairs in the exhibition, all three of those that you just saw are by the same vase painter. The Berlin painter adds a fourth horse, so we get a little bit more of the drama, right? These two guys are neck and neck and looking at one another, and then these two guys are further ahead. In fact, the race probably included a lot more horses than this, but we want to, to include a dramatic moment uh, on the vase. And then, for whatever reason, whether it's an accident of the vases that have survived um, or not as many were produced, I think probably the former, we don't have a lot of prize vases for a few generations, but we know that they were still being awarded because we get vases like this one that show a victorious rider, and here's Nike, and look at what she's holding. Now it's not a tripod or a dinos, it's the same shape of vase that we just saw, which is the actual prize that was given at the Panathenaic Games, and there's another one here on top of the turnpost. We also know around this time period from an inscription how many vases were awarded in certain events to the winners. Um, the, the greater Panathenaea was held every four years and was open to all Greeks, but there was also um, the, the warrior category, which was open only to Athenians and was a lot less prestigious. And we know that for the Kellis victor in the warrior category, um, he would get 16 amphorae of olive oil. In the Panhellenic competition, open to all Greeks from all over the Greek world, the inscription is lost, so we don't know how many. But by comparison, 
with sort of the ratio from the warrior um, competition to the open competition, it should be three or four times this. So you would win 60 or 70 of those giant olive oil filled amphorae for winning the horse race. And that's not even the most prestigious of the competitions. If you won the four horse chariot race, you would have won a lot, lot more. Uh, we also see prize vases like this one. This is on the vase upstairs in the competition. And here it's been knocked off. So if you go back to this one, remember there was a vase on top of the turn post. Here, these guys have turned so aggressively, perhaps, that they knocked into the post and it's fallen down and they're looking at it. This dates to about 440 BC, but if you think back almost 150 years, we see a similar thing, right, with what we started with in the games of Patroclus. We also have some lesser known equestrian competitions for men on horseback, and this is a really remarkable one called Quintain, or in Greek, Aphipu Akontidzain, so to throw the spear from the horse. And if we zoom in here, you can see this guy has already ridden past, and he scored a bullseye on the shield, and this guy's going to take his next shot. But think how different these guys are from the horse racers that we just saw. Again, the horses are smaller, or the jockeys are bigger, or both. Um, and these guys are wearing cloaks and traveler's caps. Um, they look a lot more like cavalrymen, like we see on this vase from Tampa that's also upstairs in the competition. And that's not surprising because this is from that warrior category of equestrian competition. Here's another one. This is an official prize vase in Berlin. And then this one, again, we're not sure what's going on. This guy's wearing a cloak like the guys who throw the javelin from horseback, but these two guys are nude. So which event is this? Is it the horse race? Is it, is it uh, the javelin from horseback? Or is it something else? And then the last sort of equestrian military competition that we, that we know of, or at least that I'll be talking about, is this one, the Antipasia, which is a mock cavalry battle. And we know quite a lot about this from literary accounts, but there are also these two remarkable monuments. And if you look here, it just looks like a guy on horseback riding towards a tripod. And similarly here, this is a four-sided stand meant to hold a bronze tripod. The bronze tripod is long gone, but we have these three reliefs and an inscription on the fourth side that tells us it's from this mock cavalry battle. And what happened in that, in that um, event is that each of the 10 tribes of ancient Athens would bring out their cavalry regiments, five on this side and five on that side, and they would converge on one another. You get a better sense of it from this uh, monument, which is broken, right? We have this part. All this is reconstructed. And the reason there's a lion here is because the tribe that won is called Leontis, the tribe of Leo, which relates, obviously, to, to the lion. Um, but if, if you look at these guys sort of marching forward in their serried ranks, it probably brings to mind the Parthenon frieze and all of those horsemen that we see. And, and we've seen a couple images from the frieze earlier today. I show you this one, which draws to mind another vase in the exhibition. And this guy, if you think about what we've seen thus far, uh, he's holding a spear or a javelin. He has his cloak on. He has his hat. Perhaps he's getting ready to compete in that javelin throwing competition. Or, since the other side of the vase shows a woman holding a torch, and we know about this nighttime procession that had to go along with the Panathenaic um, celebration, Perhaps it's part of that um, celebration, which all, I think, ties together to, to, to tell us how important um, horses are um, to, to the ongoing um, organization and, and prosperousness of the city of Athens. And with that, I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seth. That was great. Next up, uh, we will have our co-curator for this exhibition, Dr. Peter Schertz, from here at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, Peter and I were partners on this project, and while he got a crash course in horses, 
he helped me with my crash course on bases at the same time. Peter has served as the curator of ancient art here at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts since October 2006, and the Jack and Mary Ann Frabel Curator of Ancient Art since 2007. His specialty is Roman art, with a focus on the intersection of art and culture, particularly art and religion. Today, Peter is going to talk with us about chariots in the art of ancient Greece, including imagery of chariots in myth and legend, in battle, and also in competition. Thank you, Nicole. That's a very kind introduction. And I assure you that in working on this exhibition of mostly Greek vases, it was also a crash course for me because I was trained to do Roman sculpture. But one learns, and that's part of the pleasure of being a curator. I'd like to thank, um, I know we'll do a more formal thank afterwards, but for myself, I'd like to thank all of our presenters today. They have done a wonderful job. Um, all of the staff at the museum who's helped, especially our education department, which just have uh, um, made this go so smoothly. So thank you, VMFA educators, um, not just today, but for all that they have done with the exhibition, and especially with this event. Now, my topic of today is chariots in Greek art from myth to history. And you would think that a sensible person would begin with myth and then go on to history, but nobody has ever really accused me of being that sensible. So we're actually going to begin with a bit of history, and then I'll talk a little bit about myth, and then I'll go back to history. So just imagine it as the wheel of a chariot, if you will, going circular. And did I just turn that off? No. I did turn it off. So I thought I'd begin with the history of the chariot and of wheeled vehicles. The earliest wheeled vehicles seem to arise in Central Asia, possibly in Mesopotamia, in the middle of the fourth millennium BCE. And one of the interesting things to think about in terms of this project is that there's a big debate among scholars that I don't think we'll ever be able to resolve of which came first the potter's wheel or the cartwheel. And there's really no way of knowing, because when you think about it, both are sort of amazing technological advances, but both of them would require a kind of leap forward in the imagination. So there are those scholars who posit that the potter's wheel came first, and then they thought, oh, we can use that for a vehicle and others who say, oh, we have this vehicle wheel, what else can we do with it? Um, but it's an interesting question to have, a kind of chicken and egg question. The earliest wheeled vehicles were carts and were been essentially used for transportation. But by the middle of the third century, we know that they were being used in military combat. Um, and we know that partly from depictions like this, the spectacular, it's actually a box they think it was the sound box for a musical instrument that's known as the standard of Ur, and on one side of the box there are scenes of peace, and on this side there are scenes of war. And if you look at that lower frieze, it's a series... Oh, sorry. Um, if you look at that lower frieze, where it's a series of four, um, essentially, battle wagons. So four-wheeled vehicles, vehicles, each of which is able to hold at least two people, perhaps more. One of them is the driver, and one of them would be the warrior, whose job is to throw the spears or javelins at the enemy. And it gets to one of the questions that, again, we don't have a good way of resolving it, which is, how are vehicles used in warfare, um, especially horse-drawn vehicles? Here you see them riding across the enemy, uh, the fallen soldiers of the enemy. And that's one theory of how they were used, that uh, once the opponent's army broke, then you would pursue them in your chariots, or in this case, your carts. There are other theories that say, well, you would kind of circle with your carts or your chariots, 
And as the chariot comes close to the line of your opponents, the warrior will use ranged weapons like the javelins or like arrows shot from bows and be whisked away to, before the enemy soldiers can get a good line on, on you or your horses. The chariot itself as a two-wheeled vehicle is a phenomenon of the late third, probably early second millennium BCE. Uh, again, it probably originates in Mesopotamia, but much of our evidence of it actually comes from Egypt, where it's introduced by a group of people known as the Hyksoi and the Hyksoi invasion, who controlled the Nile Delta during the second intermediate period. So about 1700 to 1600 BCE, the Hyksor are expelled by the early rulers of the 18th dynasty in Egypt who inaugurate the, the new kingdom, the period of Egypt's greatest military expansion and greatest power. And as I say, much of the evidence for chariots comes from this period in Egypt partly because they adopted the chariot from the Hyksoi and really refine it both technologically and in terms of a military vehicle. So one of our best um, bits of evidence for what chariots looked like at the time comes from, oh, there I do it again, comes from King Tut's tomb. And you can see the elements of the chariot and what's striking is how much good wood it would take, like this long pole, and that you don't have that kind of tree growing in Egypt. So part of what's remarkable about Egyptian chariots and chariots in general is the resources it takes to build them. So that type of wood would have had to be imported into Egypt. The hubs of the wheels are bronze, so it take, relies on bronze technology. And the rails and the yokes and parts of the wheels, those are heat bent wood. So you had to figure out how to do that, and of course how to assemble a sturdy enough wheel. So it's a very uh, made, um, a big leap forward technologically to build these things. And as I say, the Egyptians especially used chariots in warfare, and frequently in the 18th dynasty show the pharaoh in a chariot. As on this um, casket, which is from the tomb of King Tut also, and it's an, a wonderful depiction because, aside from following the conventions of Egyptian art, where the most important person is going to be the biggest, um, you see that the pharaoh is shooting arrows, raining arrows down upon this really chaotic mass of enemies, and there's no one driving the chariot. And again, that's in keeping with the traditions of Egyptian art where you don't want to distract from the central and most important figure. So you wouldn't put a chariot driver next to the pharaoh because, you know, you want to emphasize the pharaoh. But what's also really intriguing about it is the fundamental to the Egyptian understanding of the universe was the concept of ma'at and of order. And the role of the pharaoh and more broadly the role of the Egyptians just like the role of the gods was to bring order into the chaotic world. So if you look at this image, you have the chaos on the right side, and that's the opponents of the Egyptians, and then the pharaoh and this orderly range of chariots on the left. So there's sort of progression of, from chaos to order in this depiction. And of course, on these chariots, you do see two people in each chariot. One would be the driver, and one would be the, um, the warrior, generally in Egypt, armed with bows. And of course, that's standard for Egyptian chariots, shooting with bows out of them. The apex of chariot warfare in the Bronze Age actually takes place in the 19th dynasty. And with figures like this fellow, Ramses II, a 19th dynasty ruler of Egypt, who fought with a Hittite king, Muatawi II, at the Battle of Kadesh. The Battle of Kadesh is remarkable for a couple of reasons. 
First of all, it is the largest chariot battle of the ancient world. Modern scholars estimate five to 6,000 chariots took part in it. So it's an enormous military undertaking on both sides. And what's also remarkable about it and really nice about it is the Battle of Kadesh has given us our first known peace treaty. So even though Ramses II goes back to Egypt, Kadesh is in, is in Syria, Ramses II goes back to Egypt and decorates the great temple at Abu Simbel with a relief and an inscription saying what a great victory he won. It clearly couldn't have been such a great victory because he had to sign a treaty. He couldn't just say, you know, I won, the Hittites have collapsed and Egypt rules. They fought each other to a draw with those five to 6,000 chariots. That is a battle chariots that we've been looking at, but Egyptians also use chariots for other purpose, including in ceremonial hunts. And what's sort of intriguing about it is if you notice, and I got really into counting spokes on chariots as I was working on this paper, um, just sort of obsessed with it. But the battle chariots in Egyptian art have six spokes. And the chariots of the hunting, when they're showing hunting, have four spokes. And when you think about it, it makes sense. A battle is going to be a lot harder on your chariot than a hunt, especially because these are ceremonial hunts. They know where the animals are going to be. You're not tracking them through the vastness of the deserts. You're going to the watering hole and waiting for the animals to show up so you can kill them. And the virtue of it was, in terms of Egyptian conceptions, wasn't I tracked this animal hundreds of miles and I finally caught him, but I went on a hunt and killed hundreds of animals. In this case, little bunny rabbits and little bambi deers. So, but again, they use a lighter chariot for it. And what's interesting is when you see depictions in Mycenaean art, and Sean showed a number of depictions this morning, they're all with four spokes. And it gets to one of the questions about Mycenaean chariots. We know from Mycenaean art that they knew the idea of a chariot. They're probably adopting chariots and depictions of chariots from the Near East, maybe some from Egypt. And we have from palace records um, lists of hundreds of chariots. So at Pylos, we have a linear B inscription that records 120 chariots. At Knossos, we have an inscription that records 600 chariots, which is a lot of chariots, not four or 5,000, or six, but a lot of chariots. And the thing is, with the Mycenaeans, we don't know why. And that's because chariot warfare relies on good level surfaces. If there's lots of rocks or hills, chariots don't work well. Imagine riding your bicycle you know, across a rocky surface. Remember, they don't have shock absorbers or any sort of suspension. So in Greece, a land that's notoriously hilly and rocky, what do you do with 600 chariots? And we can't be sure. We think that maybe they took them when they went raiding. And we know the Mycenaeans were great raiders, so perhaps when they raided into Asia Minor, they brought their chariots along to fight the the Assyrians and the Hittites. But again, we can't be sure. And that brings us to the myth part of the lecture. And whenever you talk about Greek myth, you sort of begin with Homer, a poet whom you would think needs no introduction because we all know Homer as the author of the Iliad and the Odyssey. But for these, this purpose, it does need an introduction because Whenever you actually try to get information out of Homer, you're faced with a whole series of questions about who was Homer, when did he live, what is he writing about, why is he writing it, and what does it mean? And you know, that series of questions comes about because Homer, or the poems that we attribute to Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, they take their current form more or less at 700 BCE, he seems to be the culmination of an oral tradition that goes back literally centuries. And they get written down in the familiar form we have them 
long after Homer actually lives, or at least they, they get standardized and codified in the, the form we have them after Homer. And the question is, when is Homer writing about the Bronze Age, the Mycenaeans? We have enough information from Homer to know that even though Mycenaean civilization, as uh, Sean mentioned earlier today, collapses about 1100 BCE, Homer, writing 400 years later, has some memories of it that was presumably an oral transmission. So that's one layer of Homer. But we also know that he's writing at the end of an oral tradition that primarily reflects early Iron Age Greek society. So what parts of Homer are about the generations of Greeks living before him? And we also know, of course, that Homer is a great poet, and what parts of Homer reflect Homer being a great poet? And again, scholars spend a great deal of time discussing these things, but what's interesting is when Homer actually talks about chariot warfare, because as we saw the Egyptians and in Near Eastern civilizations, the chariot is essentially a mobile firing platform. So there's a driver and a warrior, sometimes especially in the Near East, two warriors, and they fire ranged weapons against the enemy. And the descriptions of Homer, they don't do that. The chariots are used essentially as battle taxis. So the warrior is in his, gets into his chariot, gets brought to the line of battle, dismounts, and fights on foot. And if the battle is going badly, the warrior is able to hop back into his chariot and be whisked away to safety. And if the, chari the battle is going well, he can hop in his chariot and pursue the fleeing enemies. There's a couple of oddities about that. The most notable of which is, while well, chariot warfare was the dominant military technology and wing of Bronze Age warfare, certainly in the Near East and Egypt, chariot warfare has disappeared by the early Iron Age, and it's replaced by cavalry. So Homer himself would never have actually seen a chariot battle. So where is he getting this information? And again, he may be making it up, but it's sort of tempting to suggest, well, maybe the Mycenaeans used chariots quite differently from the Hittites and the Egyptians, and maybe the Mycenaeans did use them as battle taxis. Because again, the terrain in where the Mycenaeans live isn't suitable for chariot warfare. But again, this is a lovely lekythos that's in, in the exhibition upstairs. It's in VMFA's collection. And while we can't say that it's specifically referencing Homer, it's certainly a quasi-Homeric -Homer, scene, because just as Homer describes the goddess Athena running alongside the Argive, the Greek army, spurring them on, that's exactly what you see in this depiction. Oops. Um, with the goddess Athena wearing a helmet, you can see traces of her white skin, which indicates that, it's a fem that she's a female. She's running along, and there are four hoplites uh, running on foot, and one guy driving his chariot, wearing a kind of standard robe for a chariot called a kistin. And when you read Homer, you'll come to passages like this passage from Book Four of the Iliad, the doesn't exactly describe that scene, but it's awfully close, and again, that's why I would call it a quasi-Homeric scene. Um, in the same case upstairs, we have a similar quasi-Homeric scene, we think, of a warrior getting ready to depart in his chariot. They're preparing the chariot, and it's a wonderful depiction, A, because it's possible that it does show Memnon, an Ethiopian prince who fought at Troy, on the side of the Trojans. Um, we think that may be a way of reading Memnon. There's a number of what are called nonsense inscriptions all over this vase. The letters are proper Greek letters, but for the most part don't form words. But that might be an attempt to write Memnon. Also because often when Memnon is depicted in Greek vase art, he is shown with black African rooms like this character. But what I loved about this vase especially is the details it shows us about the chariots. 
because if you look at the chariot, you'll see these sort of hatched in lines on the pole that connects the horses to the chariot. And those hatched on lines are probably representations of the leather straps. The chariots are fragile, so they would wrap leather around the central pole especially to keep it from splitting during while it's bouncing along. Again, no shock absorbers in it. You can see how they're harnessing the horses, and this chariot is a quadriga, meaning it's a four-horse chariot. The two pole horses are already connected to the chariot. The pole horses are yoked to the central pole that's attached to the back of the chariot, and they're the two horses that actually pull the chariot along. They're a sort of two-horsepower vehicle, and this horse, who's going to put, be fitted in, oops, into that, sorry, this is a new device, a different device than I'm used to, it's smaller, who's being fitted into that harness is a tracer horse. And they are tied to the chariot also, but they're not actually pulling it. They're there, this tracer horse and this one would be the ones used to steer it. So, again, this is one of those cases that we get a great deal of information about the nature of Greek chariots, even though none of them actually survive. And interestingly enough, it has four spokes as opposed to six spokes. And if you look at the Egyptian depictions of battle chariots, and if you read the Iliad, generally the chariots that Homer describes, and generally the chariots of the Egyptian and Near Eastern cultures, they are pulled by two horses. And on some level, again, especially if you're thinking about a battle, it makes sense. Because while four horses are great, the real power, the pullers are only the two. And it's harder to train four horses to pull together. And of course, in a battle, if one horse goes down, the entire chariot goes down. So you might want only two horses to provide a smaller target while you're rushing at enemy, at enemy formations. But as I mentioned, and the Greeks of Homer's time and the Greeks who are making these vases 200 years after Homer and the late 6th century BCE, they don't know what chariots are used, how chariots are in warfare. So here you have a quadriga. And sorry, I really need to learn how to, next time I'll practice with this one. Um, you have a quadriga. And that's much closer to how the types of chariots that the Greeks used for racing. Um, Seth in his paper was just talking about the earliest equestrian competitions at Olympia. And the earliest one is called the Tethrapon, which is the four horse chariot race. And that's the standard way of racing chariots in Greece. And that seems to be sort of contaminating how the vase painters are showing war chariots, because that's the familiar chariot. Um, this is one of the a beautiful depiction of a chariot on a pananthenaic amphora, the type of prize amphora Seth was just discussing. And again, it's fun to go and look at it and see some of the details that come out on, on these vases. Because here you can see those same type of hatch marks, but on the spokes. The spokes of ancient chariots are made by heat bending wood and sort of V shapes, then gluing it together. And to reinforce the glue, you would bind them with leather again. You, these triangular wedges also help us re understand what a wheel would have looked like. They would have been attached between the spokes of the chariot and the fellow of the wheel to reinforce it. And the fellow, the circular part, would be reinforced either with sweated on iron bands or with um, rawhide. And I would imagine that with a racing chariot, you would probably use rawhide because you want a lighter vehicle. And of course, metal, while it's more durable, is going to add a good deal more weight to it. It's also fun to notice details like this little ring here. Um, it's probably made out of metal on an actual chariot, and you can see that there are reins tied to it. 
and the reins go to the pole horses because again the pole horses are yoked to the chariot the driver isn't trying to steer the chariot with them he's using the chaser horses on the outside the outriggers and he's holding the reins of the outriggers one in each hand along with his you know this long sort of whip or goat to encourage the drivers to go on, the horses to move more quickly. Um, and if you notice, on um, each of these chariots, the drivers are wearing this long white robe. And it's called a kiston. It's a, in the form of a chiton, the standard Greek male clothing, especially. And it's painted white on vase, vases regularly, and it seems to be essentially the uniform for a charioteer. It appears in all periods of Greek art, including on some of one of the chariot drivers on the geometric chariot frieze up in the exhibition, and most famously on the bronze charioteer of Delphi, who also is wearing it. These aren't belt. This one isn't belted, but probably they were belted because, again, you're moving along at speed, and you probably don't want your garment sort of blowing behind you and getting in your way. So often they seem to be belted, but the belt isn't always depicted. Chariot races were the most prestigious activity or competition in antiquity certainly at places like the Panathenaics, but even the Olympics, even though the stadium, the foot race, was the original race, and always was prestigious because of that, but chariots were prestigious and um, subjects of boasts of their victors, partly because of the tremendous wealth it took to have a chariot. I mentioned the, the technology that goes into building a chariot, but when you think about it, you have four horses that have to be trained to run in sequence and trained to run along together. So you have to own and be able to maintain four horses. You have to be able to pay the trainers for these horses. And then you need somebody to drive the chariot. Most of the time and most of the athletic competitions, the driver is not the actual owner, but just sometimes a relative of the owner and sometimes a hired, in a sense, a hired jockey. So these are very prestigious, as I mentioned. Sometimes you, a very rich person or a person trying to make a name for himself would enter multiple vehicles in a race, such as Alcibiades, a Greek general, statesman, a student of Socrates in the Peloponnesian War. Before he gets chosen to lead the Athenian campaign against Syracuse, he enters six chariot teams in the Olympics. And that's, again, a tremendous display of his wealth. And it's part of his electioneering for the post of commander for Syracuse was to say, look how important I am and, and how wealthy I was. So chariots get used as to demonstrate prestige and wealth in antiquity. It's hard for us to imagine chariot races today. We can see them in Hollywood movies, of course. But I think the best way for us sort of to imagine a chariot race is to think about NASCAR. Because the whole idea of a chariot race is speed and the potential of danger. Seth was just telling us a little bit about, um, about the hippodromes and the fact that there is no central post. So you did have head-on collisions in chariot races. If you read sort of the fullest and most detailed description of a chariot race, the competitions at the Games of Patrocles and the 24th book of the Iliad, there's several chariot crashes in them. In Sophocles' play, the Electra, somebody comes and tells Electra that her brother Orestes has been killed in a chariot race. That's not true, spoiler alert, he wasn't killed. But, you know, their teacher, a pedagogus, comes and tells Lecter, oh, your brother's dead, um, to help with the deception about the parents. So danger is always present in it. And in one particularly memorable chariot and competition, commemorated by in Pindar's fifth Pythian, um, Pythian ode, 
and 462, 40 chariots took place in a competition in Pythia, one of the Pan-Hellenic competitions, and only one of them finished. Um, excuse me, I have to... Oh. One of them finished, it belonged to King Archesilus IV of Kyrene in Libya, and again, it's, when you think about 40 chariots crashed and one finished, um, that's part of the excitement. And it's just like people today who watch NASCAR and they're seeing these marvelous technological accomplishments racing around a track. And you would think it's kind of boring and maybe it is after a while. But part of the excitement is the potential for danger. And that would have been the excitement in antiquity with a chariot race. Now, I just mentioned Pindar, and I know that Uda was talking about Pindar earlier today and saying how much she enjoys reading Pindar. Um, it kind of breaks my head to read him, try to read him in Greek, but he's a fascinating poet after all, and writes many victory odes, and that's one way that the ancient Greeks commemorate their victories. They got prizes, as Seth mentioned, but they would also try to immortalize them by commissioning poems from sort of the top talent of the Greek poetic world. They would, also commission, um, they would also commemorate their victories and their love of chariot racing by putting quadrigai on coins, as Uda was discussing earlier today. And I thought I'd finish with this coin because it's one of those coins that we discussed, that were discussed earlier today, where victory is crowning the horse. And there's a theory, especially developed by a scholar named Nigel Nicholson, that talks about how complex the chariot races were for sort of the Greek worldview. If you win a race, it's a demonstration of your arete. In this context, it would be sort of your manly virtue. But when you, it's a chariot race, the person who's actually driving the chariot usually isn't the person who wins. The person who wins is the owner. And the chariot driver and the chariot train, the horse trainers, they're almost always anonymous. Sometimes we know the names because they are relatives of the owners and important people for that sense. But especially early in the archaic period, there's a lot of discomfort with that disjunction of, well, we're showing a chariot driver, but he's not actually the guy who won the race, it's the owner. So one theory is that they often show Nike crowning the horses precisely because of that. It's an expression of their discomfort. And that kind of brings us, as I mentioned at the beginning, a chariot circle. It brings us full circle to the depictions of the pharaoh on a chariot, where again, the driver is actually is literally absent from these. They don't even show the driver. But of course, we know that if you're shooting a bow an arrow from a bow at somebody, somebody has to be driving the chariot, but the Egyptians don't want to show it, and the Greeks generally don't want to talk about it. So um, that seemed to be an appropriate place to end because I closed my circle, and so many of the speakers earlier today gave hints and clues as to what was in my paper, so I kind of feel it's a good way to close the the speakers today. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, now we'll have an opportunity for more questions from the audience uh, for our afternoon speakers. So Dr. Pevnik and Dr. Oakley um, will join us on stage for that. We are told to move into the light. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the guy left holding the mic. Okay, so I've been thinking about that dog a lot. Um, first of all, what very, very clearly demonstrates that we have a dog chasing after chariots 2,500 years ago as dogs evolved in order to chase 
human vehicles, because they still do that today. <laughs> On the other hand, I asked my good colleague and friend Seth, in whose collection that depiction is, what's with the dog? Um, you want to take a shot at it? <laughs> I think the dog is there to indicate the speed at which they're moving, but also to fill out the composition. And so just like on some of the vases I showed where there were prizes underneath the horses, that probably didn't happen, right? They probably weren't racing over the tripods that they were racing for. The dog, I don't think, is actually amidst the chariots, but it's there um, to indicate the speed. We, we have another vase in Tampa that didn't travel for the exhibition that also shows a chariot race. And in addition to dogs, there are also birds flying along. So those, I think, indicate the speed above the horses while the dogs indicate the speed below. Thank you. Uh, just a question, I'm not sure who's the best person. And thank you, this is wonderful. Um, I know for certain um, topics, like those you know, craters for drinking and all that, you have certain is there anything specific with horses where it's, you know, they were specifically more funerary or more for you know, specific purposes? Do, do they relate more to the function? Could <laughs> 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 you possibly, <laughs> possibly rephrase that? <laughs> yeah, is, is, um, does the presence of the horse and the type of vase or vessel that indicate its purpose in the way that we do have like drinking and things like that. Bacchus, it tends to be those are like creators things. You know, they're associated with festivities. Does the president of the horse? There's no, there's no, I don't think there's any specific shape that's only tied to, tied to horses. I think they can appear just about anywhere. Is that, is that what you were after? Okay, we, we survived that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Horses are the most common animals depicted on Greek vases, so you do see them on virtually every shape. Um, even if maybe they appear a little bit more on this vessel than that vessel, I don't think it would be enough. It's not a big enough variant to demonstrate anything. Hi. Um, I have a question concerning those, one of the slides in um, the PowerPoint, but any of you can answer. So this is uh, the Bergen Amphora that you showed, um, and this is related to the, you know, what scholars identify as Sinoris. And that charioteer is sort of sitting in the car pretty comfortably, and uh, compared to the other images that we saw, they were all standing. I uh, just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, I, I think there are clearly two um, equids, I would say, pulling the car. And so some scholars have said since it's a cart, it's the mule cart race, um, which I think is apene in Greek. If it's horses, then it's the sinoris. But I don't think there's consensus. Um, on some of the coins in the exhibition and other depictions of mules, they are clearly pulling a cart, and that's you know, my inclination would say it's probably a mule cart race because of the form of the vehicle. But again, if you look at the horses and it's of the equids pulling them, and of course mules can look very, very similar to horses, on that basis you can't really tell. Well, remember that the pole, sorry. the pole horses are attached to a stiff pole. The pole doesn't, it's not on a, on a hub or anything. It can only be pulled straight forward. And, you know, um, I don't know if you've ridden a bicycle recently, but one way of turning a bike actually is just you lean and your weight will help the bicycle turn, even if you're not actually turning the wheel and these horses are guiding the other horses and sort of throwing the momentum towards one side or the other. But again, those pole horses are attached to a fixed pole. Um, 
and the tracer horses, from what we can tell from the vase depictions, and again, we're, we don't have any Greek chariots, they are harnessed, um, you know, harnessed to the other horses, but not directly pulling the chariot itself. I don't know if that helps explain it or not. <laughs> And, uh, and I'm sorry, I'd like to comment on the, the dog in the, uh, the scene with the, uh, the chariot. Uh, on the, the inside of today's program, there's a, a rider with a dog uh, associated, um, not in a chariot scene. I don't know if that's a hunting scene or, or what, but there's an elite Athenian who's riding a horse carrying spears, and I think that the, the uh, equine equipment that indicates his social and financial status. And the dog is with him. But the dog also appears in uh, departure scenes uh, where the, uh, the dog is staying home and the, uh, the person is, is leaving, or maybe it's maybe the dog is going along. And the, the dog also occurs uh, under the, the occasion of a, of a kunei in a symposium scene. So I'm wondering if the, the dog might be a kind of attribute of the elite Athenian that, uh, that participates in uh, symposiastic activity, in hunting, <coughs> and in and in warfare, all three are the masculine activities. So I wonder if it's part of that. I mean, there are older people and younger people who have dogs. They can be dressed as travelers and have a dog accompany them. Uh, they can have dogs tied to the symposium uh, table so they can eat the food that's underneath it. So uh, I see it as a, it's too broad an area with too many paths to go to make one, one generalization, I think. Okay, good, thanks. Is it possible that the, the tracer horses uh, were used after two uh, horizontal lines of combatants engaged each other? The tracer horses were used by the wounded party to get back up because his chariot was destroyed, but he could get on the tracer horse and get away? Um, well, again, that gets into the really challenging notion of chariot warfare has ceased to be actually practiced by about 900 BCE. From then on, and especially in the Greek world, you have cavalry. And again, some of that's going to be economic with the collapse of the Mycenaean palace culture. They don't have the material and human resources to maintain a fleet of chariots. But some of it, it's one of the really puzzling things to me is it apparently took people in the Mediterranean a long time to figure out how do you ride a horse comfortably. So the first reference to cavalry actually comes from Assyria, and um, it's the father of Ashurbanipal, and I forget his name, but he lives about 870, he rules about 870, and there's an inscription that refers to his horsemen, which is taken as the first direct reference to cavalry. About a thousand years earlier, at the time of Hammurabi, we have an inscription from a site called Mari in Mesopotamia, where a major domo was advising his king, when you go and visit those sophisticated cities in, in Akkad, ride on a chariot. Don't ride a horse, R use a chariot. And if you have to ride something, ride on a mule, because otherwise, that's not, otherwise you will lose your royal dignity. So he's specifically warning the ruler, don't ride a horse because it's not dignified. Um, and again, for me as a non-horse person, it's kind of peculiar. Why would it be so hard to ride a horse but not a, not a mule or a donkey? But um, historically in the Mediterranean world, we don't have good evidence of horse people riding horses individually till rather late. Uh, the first picture of a, of a chariot was a, of a four-wheeled chariot, uh, and then all the rest, all the remaining pictures were two-wheeled chariots. The four-wheeled chariot would strike me, even if the wheels were working independently, as to not being able to turn very easily. Is that why they 
switch it over to two wheelchairs? Um, the first picture, which is from Sumer, um, it's a four-wheeled cart, we believe. And when you think about and it's being pulled by onagers, who are, which are wild asses in Central Asia. Um, and in terms of turning, I'm not sure. You know, again, if you think about how, you know, big semi-trucks get turned and it's, you know, the front part turns and that whole thing that comes behind just sort of follows along after it, um, I'm not sure that that would apply, but chariots <coughs> will be smaller and lighter, and probably that would be, you know, that explains the transition from the carts to the chariot, the two-wheeled vehicles. Thank you, Peter. Please join me in welcoming Nicole Stripling back to the stage for closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you for those great questions. As always, um, add so much to a, a program like this. Um, you know, our, one of our goals for this um, exhibition and project was to hopefully introduce new audiences to ancient Greek art uh, through this very accessible, very approachable theme of the horse that runs through all of these objects and these images that we've been talking about today. Uh, we also wanted to expand the context of the horse and art in general. Um, you know, so many of these themes and topics we can see in modern art, in the sporting art, in our collection in Middleburg, um, and also here in other works. Uh, themes of competition and sport and horsemanship, um, and also the horse as symbol of uh, wealth and beauty and power and speed. So whether you are an expert in ancient Greek art or an expert in horses or new to both, um, I hope that you have found some objects or some stories uh, that really speak to you uh, in this show and in some of these presentations. I'd like to thank all of our speakers um, today. Um, you've all done a wonderful job and shared a lot of really great information with us um, and images. Uh, I'd like to thank the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts staff, particularly uh, Izzy Fuqua and Lu Lan Yu in the Educations Department for organizing this wonderful program. And like with any project of this nature, uh, we always have to thank our generous lenders and our sponsors because exhibitions and books and programs like this wouldn't be possible without them. If you enjoyed today's program and you cannot get enough of horses in ancient art, I strongly encourage you to take a look at the exhibition catalog that accompanies the show. It is available for sale in the shop. And of course, I hope that you will come back and visit the exhibition many times before it leaves. It's on view through July 8th. So thank you again for joining us today. And please do join us in the show uh, upstairs before you leave today. Thank you.